And since we are here, you know, I can ask everybody who's here to think about any discussion questions that they would want to see discussed in the 1130 session, and you can just put those in a chat. Uh, so if there's anything in your mind that comes up during the session, just go ahead and uh, put it in the chat and we'll add it to the discussion items. And I assume you can you can all see my screen. I I shared it, but I don't actually know if it's visible. Yep, we see your screen. Okay, thanks. All right, well, it looks like uh, I see 40 participants are showing up in my, on my Zoom here. So I think it's about um, time for us to get started. Um, I'm Kathy Pejon. I'm one of the co-chairs of the Earth System Prediction Working Group. Um, and uh, the other co-chairs, uh, Yaga Richter and um, Steve Yeager. Um, and we're going to uh, start off today uh, with just a um, brief introduction, um, reminding you here of um, of uh, NCAR's um, respectful dialogue and um, and um, kind of um, rules of engagement here. Um, so I'll remind you that um, as we uh, have our presentations and have discussion, um, to please um, offer constructive feedback, um, to share the air, to acknowledge teamwork, to encourage innovation, to show appreciation and consider new ideas. Um, and I think this is really um, this in the spirit of a working group uh, meeting. So um, please um, engage in discussion and and um, let's um, make and you know discuss some really um, exciting um, new ideas and, and things we can do um, in the Earth, in the ASPWG. All right. So um, it's already um, almost time to for our first uh, presentation. So I really just want to welcome you to to our meeting. Um, and thank you for coming. I know um, we may all be getting tired of, of, of virtual meetings, um, but um, it really is a great opportunity for all of us to, to come together um, from no matter where we are. Um, and that really is the wonderful benefit of, of this virtual um, platform. So thank you all for joining us um, from wherever you're sitting. Um, Yaga, Steve, is there anything else um, you want me to uh, remember to say before we get started with our presentations? Um, Kathy, I'm just wondering if we might want to point people to our Google Doc on ideas for future CSL allocation. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, can you put that link in the chat window as a reminder? Yeah. Yeah, so this afternoon in our discussion, we'll be talking about future simulations and ideas for future simulations um, for ESTWG. Uh, and we really want to um, this to be a community effort um, and um, community ideas that we can coalesce around. Uh, so if you have ideas around that, please um, enter those into the Google document that will help to facilitate um, discussion this afternoon. Um, and Steve just put that in the chat window. So um, please click on that and, and enter your ideas um, for discussion. Anything else, Steve or Yaga? I think that's it, you got it. All right. Well, then um, we will move forward with our presentations. And I'll just remind you um, that you can put questions um, or comments in the chat window, or you can raise your hand and I'll call on you. 
Um, our first presentation is identifying state-dependent predictability of sea surface temperatures in CESN2 with artificial neural networks, and the speaker is Emily Gordon. Um, cool, so I'll just go ahead and share my screen. That one. Awesome. Um, can you all see? Yep, we can see it. Um, perfect. Yeah, now it's in full screen mode. Thank you. Awesome. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for having me um, speak today. Um, I'm going to present some of the work that I've been doing in my PhD with um, Dr. Elizabeth Barnes here at Colorado State University. And we've been looking at um, predicting sea surface temperatures um, in the CSM2 pre-industrial control with artificial neural networks and specifically on this idea of looking for state dependent predictability in our predictions. Um, so I'm gonna start with this figure that we've already seen a few times this week. Um, I really like it. It sort of demonstrates where we're looking for predictability when we're on different time scales. So I've been looking at decadal prediction, which is how the climate evolves around two to 10 years in the future. So we're at this sort of area in this figure and we're looking at predictability associated with the ocean. So patterns of ocean variability, such as um, AMV, so Atlantic multidecadal variability, or uh, Pacific variability in the form of the um, Pacific decadal variability or interdecadal Pacific oscillation. And um, it's also worth noticing, uh, notice, noting that um, external forcing can also provide predictability. So um, rising temperatures due to greenhouse gas emissions or volcanic eruptions can also provide pr uh, predictability. And these also interact with our internal um, variability in the ocean. So um, as we are thinking about um, predicting uh, on decadal timescales. Um, recent studies have looked at how predictability can be influenced by the initial state of the system. So some initial state states are more predictable than others. And so um, here I'm showing a figure from this paper by Boucher et al. Um, from 2018 who used MPI-ESM uh, initialized hindcasts um, to predict SSTs in the North Atlantic subpolar gyre. And they found that their SSD predictions were more uh, uh, more skillful following periods of anomalously strong ocean heat transport into the gyre region. So this figure has lead year on the x-axis and uh, anomaly correlation coefficients. So uh, skill, basically forecast skill on the y-axis and these red um, forecasts here are the strong um, ocean heat transport forecasts showing that they were uh, more skillful. And then the study here using the CESM DPLE, so the Decadal Prediction Large Ensemble by Kristen Citadel, showed that information um, retained by initialized hindcasts in the North Atlantic corresponded to the state of the AMO. So down here we have the sort of information retained by the hindcast, and we can see that it corresponds fairly well to these um, high amplitude phases of the AMO. So these studies both demonstrate that there is state dependent predictability on decadal timescales. And so studies of predictability across timescales, so not just decadal, but also east-to-west and east-to-i, have encouraged this focus to stay dependent predictability. And so here we're going to present a data-driven approach to identifying state dependent predictability, and we're going to use the CSM2 pre-industrial control for CMIP6. So we are specifically interested in state dependent predictability of internal variability. And we're going to use an artificial neural network to, for this problem. So an artificial neural network is a collection of nodes and connections which map some input to an output. So we could think of having our inputs here on the left um, and uh, each of these points on these maps is connected to our artificial neural network, which is basically a, a collection of nonlinear functions. And then we have these outputs here. So in our particular problem, we are inputting three maps of ocean heat content, OHC, uh, integrated to from the surface to 100 meters, surface to 300 meters, and surface to 700 meters. And these are averaged over this uh, previous five years. And these are our inputs to our neural network. So as I said, every point from these maps is connected to our artificial neural network. So to these hidden layers here, which are these uh, nodes and bias terms, which form our nonlinear functions. And then this is connected to an output layer which is a prediction, in this case, we're doing a prediction of sea surface temperature, SST anomaly in one to five years at some point in the ocean. So the average anomaly in one to five years. And so just to really go over this, we're, having, we're inputting ocean heat content uh, over the previous five years 
uh, averaged over the previous five years, and then we're outputting a prediction of SST anomaly in one to five years at some point in the ocean. And I want to specifically dig into what we're doing here on our output layer. So this output is a prediction of sea surface temperature in one to five years. And for this example, we're going to do a prediction here in the North Atlantic subpolygyre. We train our artificial neural network to predict, we call it a mu, an anomaly, but also a sigma, an uncertainty range. So that an n has two outputs. It's the SST anomaly and an associated uncertainty. During the training process, the ANN is optimized so that it assigns a lower uncertainty value to initial states that are, more, uh, are likely to result in lower error. So if the neural network learns if the sample is more predictable, it should predict a correspondingly lower uncertainty. Also, the neural network is not penalized for poor predictions as long as it predicts a correspondingly high uncertainty. So in this way, the neural network is, is able to learn more predictable states in the data with its uncertainty value. And um, we, so in this figure here, I'm showing again this ANN trained to predict SST in the North Atlantic. And on the y axis here, we have the uh, mean absolute error in the predictions. Um, and so for a neural network which has properly learned predictability in the data, we should find that um, predicted prediction error, so the difference between the, uh, the predicted anomaly and the true anomaly, decreases as we sort for more confident predictions. And I, when I say more confident, I mean lower uncertainty. I'm gonna use those interchangeably. So um, for example, here, uh, we are looking at the 100% most confident uh, prediction. So this is just all of the predictions in our testing set. And the error for, our, um, for these samples is 0.52. So this would be the error we would you know, quote on our neural network across all of our testing data. It has a mean absolute error of about 0.52. However, if we then say, actually, we're going to just throw out the 50% of samples that have the highest predicted uncertainty, so we're going to keep the 50% most confident samples, we find that our error has now dropped to about 0.45. And we can keep playing this game. And we can get, uh, we could say, you know, we're only going to um, keep the 20% most confident samples. And now we find that our error has dropped to about 0.42. And so this is showing that the neural network has identified uh, what samples are more predictable. And it also achieves lower error on these samples. And so what we have done in this study is I just showed one neural network, which is somewhere up here in the North Atlantic, but we actually trained a neural network at every point in the ocean. Um, so these, uh, this color scale is showing mean absolute error, and so brighter colors indicate more skill. These black regions are where the neural network uh, did not out outperform climatology, but we do have regions where the neural network is finding um, some skill. And we also find that this spatial spread of skill is in regions where the ocean is considered more predictable. So, for example, the North Atlantic shows good skill uh, in the North Pacific, and then there's some skill across these deep, uh, deeper mixed layer areas in the uh, Southern Ocean. But then what we can do is, as I did before, is we could only look at the 20% most confident predictions at each grid point. And so we, again, we take our testing set and we say, what are the 20% lowest uncertainty values? And we're going to just plot the error for those ones. And we find that in many places, our skill uh, increases. So I, a nice example is here off the west coast of Africa. Uh, we find we have little skill on uh, across our entire testing set. But when we say neural network, what have you, what have you learned? It, it, there are some places where it, where it has found initial states that do lead to it having uh, more skill. And so what we can then do is we can say, we can look to make sure that these um, predictions make sense. And so now I'm looking again at this artificial neural network training to predict uh, sea surface temperatures in the North Atlantic subpolar gyre. And I'm showing the composite sea surface temperature map at the input, so the initial state that led to confident predictions um, in the North Atlantic. And here we find that we have this anomalously positive um, ocean heat, uh, sea surface temperature, uh, sort of in the subtropical to mid-latitude um, North Atlantic. And then we can look at the composite one to five years later, so at the time of prediction. And what do we see here? We find that this uh, blob of heat has moved northward into the gyre region. And so this is suggesting that there has been this northward uh, transport of heat. 
and that has led to the neural network's um, increased uh, confidence. And so this is a, a state that it has, um, this, this initial state is one that the neural network has identified as more predictable. We can also link it to uh, large scale um, ocean variability to sort of um, get a general picture of how the ocean is behaving at the time of input. So here I'm showing histograms of on the left is AMV, Atlantic Multidecadal Variability, and on the right, IPO, Interdecadal Pacific Oscillation Index. And the shading is the uh, distribution of the indices across the entire testing set. And then the outline is where we've chosen only the 20% most confident samples corresponding to this initial state. And we find that for uh, this, this state, we have um, a, a slightly positive AMV, which means that we have you know, a positive um, SST anomaly in the North Atlantic. But interestingly, we also find that there is this leftward shift of our distribution in the IPO index. And we can see that here in this SST input figure as well, suggesting that, uh, the, that these skillful initial states uh, co uh, coincided with a negative phase in the IPO, which may suggest some sort of um, interface and teleconnection, uh, which led to the ANN's uh, skillful predictions. And then we can play this game again in the North Pacific Ocean. So I've grabbed this neural network um, at this point here and, we can, and we're doing the same thing. I'm gonna look at the composite SST map at input and we find that it is showing a fairly strong um, positive IPO PDV um, pattern at the input time. So it's saying that this positive pattern is a skillful initial state for predicting SSTs in this region. And then again, we can look at the composite SST map one to five years later, and this shows uh, persistence in the IPO. So we have, again, this IPO pattern, particularly these um, negative anomalies in the Crucio extension. Um, so it is seen that the ANN is confident about predicting uh, positive to positive persistence in the IPO. And an interesting result that we had was that the neural network appeared to be much more confident about positive to positive persistence over negative to negative persistence, which suggests some sort of um, uh, non-linearity in the way that uh, the neural network was viewing persistence in the IPO. So I have some sort of future work that I'm interested in with this, this study. Um, and first of all, I think we need to think about state-dependent predictability in the hide and cast um, study. So it's already been done a little bit with the CESM DPLE. Um, but I'm interested in seeing, you know, if we're looking at our, uh, our forecasts that have um, higher skill, what can we, you know, what initial states can we back out? And then what can we learn about our models in this, in this paradigm? You know, if, if we've got a state that, that, that uh, performs better against observations, does this mean that our model um, is particularly good at uh, making this, uh, recreating this process? Or does it mean that this was a, a more predictable process that had more memory? Um, also, so this study that I've shown, we do predictability due to internal variability. Um, and how does this uh, perform in force simulations where we have external forcing and or in observations, do we still find that we are having um, this IPO uh, teleconnection? And then as I just hinted at, is there a link between the state of the Pacific Ocean and North Atlantic predictability outside of this control run? Um, the, yeah mechanisms behind North Atlantic uh, variability are still pretty highly debated. And I think this is a, an interesting um, lens to view this through. Um, and so I'm gonna finish, I'll just leave up, these are my key points. And this work is currently in review at GRL, but we have a preprint available online if for your perusal. Thank you, Emily. Um, I can't actually see all the participants, but um, hopefully if you raise your hand, it'll pop. Oh, Jerry, go ahead. Uh, that's really interesting, Emily. Um, I was curious, you're training on different layers of ocean heat content, right? Yeah. Um, is there any way you can narrow down kind of which layer is producing most? I assume it's the upper, upper ocean part, but it could be the Atlantic. It could be different. It could be deeper. Um, I mean, could you, and I suppose you could retrain it based on different inputs from the ocean heat content layers, but it'd be a thought about that, trying to narrow it down a little bit as to what's producing the predictability. 
Yeah, um, so we, uh, in the paper, we do a little bit of um, your network explainability. So this is sort of um, attributing different, you know, blobs of heat in the ocean and how they um, uh, corresponded to um, predictable outputs. And from what I can recall, for, so for the North Atlantic, um, we found that it was in the upper ocean where the, um, where a lot of the skill um, came from. But because we were doing this sort of study, we were like, okay, we want to use the same inputs and do every point in the ocean. We wanted to have all three layers to make sure that, you know, this would work everywhere, everywhere if that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. All right. We have time for one more question. John, go ahead. Yeah, so I, I had a question about the observations you might use and whether using a field like sea level that's observed from satellite very well, and, and given that upper ocean heat content that seems to be so important, that would be a very good uh, indicator of that. Have, have you thought about using sea level from satellite? Um, not sea level in particular, but I, I should have actually put this as future work. I think I think this is really, really important that, uh, that we... Uh, that I'm starting to think about grounding this in, in observable quantities because OHC is such a different, a difficult thing to, to measure in observations. Um, so I guess like the answer is no, I hadn't thought specifically about sea level, but yes, I'm definitely thinking about how can I relate this work more to, to the observed um, climate. All right, thank you so much, Emily. Very um, interesting talk and um, great questions. There's also a question in the chat window um, if you'll, um, follow up when you get a chance. Yeah, um, absolutely. All right. Okay, our next talk um, is subpolar North Atlantic cold extremes in CESM initialized predictions um, from Elizabeth Maroon. Go ahead. Hi, can you hear me and see my screen? Yes, I can hear you and I can see your screen. Great, things are working, that's encouraging. Um, so hello from the University of Wisconsin. Um, this is a continuation of something that I think I last presented here, the ESP working group maybe a year or two ago. So um, we've been looking at this challenging 2015 cold anomaly prediction in the subpolar North Atlantic and trying to take a forensic approach to figure out what went wrong in the DPLE. Um, so this talk is looking at uh, more comparatively across a bunch of other decadal prediction systems from all of the collaborators uh, that are listed here. And I wanna thank them for being generous with their feedback and their um, providing the output from their systems. It's been um, starting to become useful to figure out what's different going on. So, I mean, the motivation is that extreme oceanic events, such as marine heat waves here on the left, or these marine cold spells or cold blobs, um, are the most impactful on ecosystems and society. Uh, so being able to predict these on monthly or longer timescales would be valuable. Um, so stick around in about you know, 30 minutes for Evan Meeker's talk. Um, he'll talk about the predictability of marine heat waves um, in SMILE. Um, but the focus of my talk is uh, the 2015 cold blob. And, is this isn't just you know, a DPLE issue, it is a uh, societally relevant issue because this event um, contributed to the heat wave that summer in Europe. Uh, so what was the issue? Um, in the 20, so 2015, there was a cold anomaly in the North Atlantic. Um, it was near record, so you can see that in the time series below, um, but something else that made it quite um, uh, prominent is just its large spatial extent. So you can see, if you can see my arrow, um, it's just, it was just a very large, um, took up most of the subpolar North Atlantic, uh, which also made it unique. So the CSM decadal prediction large ensemble totally failed with this event. Um, despite, you know, otherwise having really high skill in subpolar North Atlantic SST. I mean, this is where the DPLE really shines. This is where it adds a lot of initial value predictability over the uninitialized CSM large ensemble. So on the top here, we have um, summertime 2015 predictions uh, from observations. You can see the cold blob there. Um, the box is what I'll be using for subpolar North Atlantic SST going forward. The bottom is the nine month prediction from the CSM1 DPLE. And you can see that while there is still some indication that there had been some sort of cold anomaly there closer to initialization, if anything, now it's warm. Um, None of the ensemble members captured this. The ensemble mean is warm. It was a real miss. Uh, and so if you, if it's, this is just for a nine month prediction, but if you use earlier hind casts, so for a two, three, four year predictions, they're even worse. So the goal is to try to figure out what went wrong in the DPLE is there's things that we can figure out um, for how to improve it. Uh, and we're gonna be looking at this earlier prediction, six to nine, nine months, because this is where things seem to go wrong earliest. 
So let's talk a little bit about the characteristics of this event. Um, so we know sort of it's things that we might be looking for in terms of um, predictability. So the event actually, the cold blob started uh, the previous year in 2013. There was a very strong East Atlantic pattern that provided a lot of cooling. Um, at the time of initialization for the November 2014 DPLE, uh, we have, you can see here in observations, an already cold anomaly that gradually becomes more intense and larger as you go through winter and spring of 2015. It really peaks in extent quite large during 2015's summer. Um, right here, we've got half molars of um, ocean, upper ocean temperature and um, salinity. And this event wasn't just a, a, a cold blob at the surface, it really extended to depth. So here you can see this cold blob, especially starting um, January of 2014, uh, extends down near to a thousand meters depth. And it was part of this um, more long lasting fresh blob um, that is also present in subpolar North Atlantic that you can read about in Holiday et al. 2020. So in terms of the atmospheric forcing that was um, really key for amplifying and sustaining that initial cold anomaly that was there in 2014 fall, um, there were two periods and two different, um, yeah, two periods worth looking at. The first is there was about, I don't know, a 0.2 of a degree Celsius drop from January to April of 2015. This was associated with a very positive winter and spring um, NAO. It was very persistent, uh, caused a lot of cooling. Um, but because of the deep winter mixed layer depths, this cooling only translated to a little bit uh, of surface temperature change. But it was important for sustaining and then intensive the later um, intensification for the cold anomaly. The big drop, however, came during um, spring and summer of 2015. So from May to July, there was a drop of 0.6 degrees Celsius. This was associated with a relatively modest cooling flux, so about 10 watts per meter squared. Um, but with shallower summer mixed layer depths, it didn't take um, much cooling to really um, amplify the strong surface cooling. So in terms of are these um, different atmosphere forcings predictable, um, there's some indication that um, Wind, first winter and second winter NAO may be predictable in some systems, particularly the Depressus three system. Um, but I'd argue that nine months in advance, um, you're not gonna be able to predict May and June, um, such modest surface heat fluxes. So for this latter period, what we're going to be hoping for in the DPLE is that it has sufficient spread to capture these modest cooling and hopefully no bias. So that means um, based on the events we've got here um, going through this, there's a couple of features that we're thinking are probably skill needed for a skillful 2015 prediction. You need a reasonable initialization. So you have to have the cold blob in the right place. Hopefully you also have the salinity anomalies both at the surface and at depth, somewhat accurate. Um, you might hope that you have a positive wintertime NAO prediction. Um, some systems show that, so most don't. Um, so hopefully you encompass that uh, very strong positive NAO within your spread, even if you can't predict its signal. Um, finally, by the time you get to May and June, you'd hope that you'd have sufficient spread and little bias in the surface heat fluxes that were necessary for that amplification of the cooling. And then, you know, maybe finally the fourth ingredient would be you want a model that represents North Atlantic climate processes just well enough. So maybe it's only the CSM1 DPLE that's very much struggled with this event. What about other systems? Um, so thanks to all of um, our Blue Action collaborators, um, we've collected 12 different hindcasts from eight different systems. These are all from initialized in late 2014 or early 2015. So we've got the DPLE and SMILE, um, and I'm using three initializations um, from SMILE and examining more. We've got Depressus 3 and Depressus 4 from MedOffice, EC Earth, um, two initializations from IPSL, and three initializations from NOR CPM, one um, with their CMIP 5 configuration and two with their CMIP 6 configuration. And as you can see from this table, there's a bunch of different initialization techniques, ensemble sizes, number of years present, um, resolutions. These are very different systems. So hopefully, um, there will be something that stands out depending on how these systems do. So first here, I've got two metrics for the summer cold blob um, skill. So on the x-axis, I've got cold blob intensity. So just in that subpolar North Atlantic box, how cold was it? And on the y-axis, I've got cold blob extent. It's not possibly too surprising to see that there's some you know, relationship between extent and intensity. Um, up here in the left-hand corner is our observations 
And down here is all of our CSM family of hindcast. So the deep belief initialized in November 2014, and then the th um, three smile initializations that are prior to um, summertime 2015. So you can see that the November initialization from smile is actually an improvement on the DPLE, which had a warm cold blob. Um, well, that doesn't even make sense. It had a warm anomaly where you should have cold. Um, so already there's been improvement. And then these other two dots are, as you might imagine, February and May. As you get closer to the event, things are getting colder. Um, though there is quite a gap between this May smile initialization and the observed 2015 uh, summer, even only two months in advance. So here's the other families um, from systems. You'll notice there are a few that are kind of like the DPLE that are uh, warm when they should be cold. And then there's um, some that are on the other side. None of these ensemble mean predictions really get you close to what the observations were. One thing I do want to point out though, is that all three of the NOR CPM initializations that we have with various different um, initial, um, I think there's two different initialization techniques and then two different model um, configurations. Um, they're all negative. So that's kind of encouraging that there's something um, that's in that configuration that might be working better with this event. So we can take a look next at all of the ensemble members to see if um, this event was encompassed in the spread. So now I've um, pulled apart all 12 of these hindcasts by intensity and extent. Um, the dark dots are ensemble means and all the crosses are each ensemble member. You'll notice that some of these May smile um, simulations get pretty darn close to what was observed. There's also a couple of the Pressus ensemble members getting close to what was observed. And the North CPM also are starting to get close some, in some of those ensemble members. Um, so some of the ensemble members do have um, cold blobs similar to what was observed, even if some of these ensemble members are too warm, ensemble means, sorry. So I think the biggest issue that we've noticed with the DPLE going forward is that it, um, if this is a time series of the DPLE, oh, DPLE's um, sea surface temperature, um, it has these upward trends that's also present in SMILE. So almost immediately from initialization, it warms up instead of sustaining and persisting. Um, so maybe this is the null hypothesis for a prediction system that if you have a cold anomaly, it's gonna wanna damp back towards climatology. Um, or if you have a warm anomaly, it's going to damp back towards climatology also, that maybe this is just what we should expect. Um, but it is present in all of the CSM initializations for this event. Um, however, there are a couple of the other prediction systems that manage to sustain, persist and sustain. Um, so for example, all three of the NOR CPM initializations really persist and don't um, warm up. Um, from keep going on. And the two depressive systems also are managed uh, to persist through winter and spring until the summer when they, they warm up and miss the amplification of that event. So we took just a quick look at upper ocean heat temperature. So I've got all four systems again, um, time series. The um, In general, the CSM systems are kind of missing within the spread, um, the upper ocean heat content in uh, the summertime. And then something I also noticed that's a little interesting is that the spread in the upper ocean salinity is much narrower in the CSM um, hindcasts than in the other ones. And this could be suggestive of how um, the initialization for CSM being very different. And then I'd also like to point out that salinity is pretty well predicted in SMILE relative to CSM. Um, so a few hind, uh, as I'm running out of time, very quickly, a few hindcast members were able to predict a springtime NAO as positive as observed. Probably we shouldn't um, expect that. So that ingredient is missing. Um, there's also a tendency for those May and June 2015 surface heat flux, fluxes to be more positive, um, to have a positive bias. So black line is the observed, this histogram, so surface heat flux anomaly, both in May and June, most of the ensemble members for the entire multi-model um, hindcasts are skewed a bit positive. So that's something I think worth looking into a bit more. Um, so in summary, I think the most notable issue going forward that needs figuring out um, is comparing is figuring out why the DPLE and SMILE have this um, warming up during this event. Um, so SMILE also has this, but the North CPM and the, to some extent Depressus does not. Um, SMILE shows a lot of improvement in the cold blob prediction over the DPLE. 
um, upper ocean salinity has been notably improved. Um, but something interesting to note is that DPLA smile tend to have narrower spread in salinity compared to the upper, other um, hindcast systems, likely due to how they're initialized. In general, and um, the NAO that winter was not really predicted by any system. Um, spread in the surface heat fluxes um, encompassed the observed modest summer cooling, but may have a positive bias. And as I finally finished this very long lingering study up, there are a couple of remaining possibilities to track down across these um, multiple models. One is a little closer look at if there might be any biases, mixing or stratification. Um, and then also taking a, a little closer look at what kind of drift there is um, comparatively in each system. So thank you for your time. I'm happy to take a couple of quick questions. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, I think we have time for maybe one quick question um, or if uh, um, people want to put questions in the chat window so that um, Elizabeth can respond um, to those as well. Um, I'm not seeing any raised hands. Um, so um, thank you, Elizabeth, and we will move on to the next talk. So our next talk is using neural networks to predict temporary slowdowns in decadal climate warming trends from Zachary Leib. Go ahead. All right, hopefully you can all see my screen and that the slides uh, transition that has happened in the past. Um, so I'll get started. So hi, everyone. My name is Zach Labe. I'm currently a postdoc that I just started at GFDO and Princeton University. And this work was done at um, Colorado State University, working with Dr. Elizabeth Barnes that I'll be presenting today. And something that I really like to do in my free time is make visualizations of climate data. And so I thought I'd start off with this graph and probably a lot of you recognize it because it's one of the most familiar graphs of climate change data. It is the global mean surface temperature record by year. And like many climate variables, even though it is globally averaged, you still see lots of interannual variability and decadal variability or longer time scales. But today I wanna to really focus on one period of this sort of decadal variability, which is highlighted in the blue box here, and it's the infamous climate change hiatus. And this period sparked plenty of interesting studies that tried to figure out why there was this brief temporary slowdown in the rate of the global warming temperature trend, as you can see here. And one of the motivations for this work was not only that period of variability in the global mean surface temperature, but also what you look in the upper right. And you can see in the most recent years, there's been another period of a brief slowdown in the rate of the temperature trend over a couple of years. And so I just want to point out, of course, this is nothing, not a new topic by any means. There, in fact, there was a whole part of the IPCC AR5 report devoted to this topic. And there have been plenty of studies trying to evaluate what really was the cause of that early 2000s slowdown or hiatus period. And then trying to sort of assess, you know, not only sort of the physical mechanisms in the climate system, but also observational data and, and the record for those. And it was not only interesting from a scientific perspective, of course, this period had caused a lot of interest, both in the media and politically, trying to understand, you know, this brief slowdown in the temperature trend of the global mean surface temperature record. So I want to point out, as I've just shown some examples, there's been hundreds of papers that have looked at this early 2000 slowdown period. And here's just another graph using multiple reanalysis and observationally station-based data sets, all sort of showing this period again in the early 2000s. But when you look, you know, it overall fits within our understanding of internal variability in the climate system. And I also want to point out that over this period, using some of the most recent uh, global mean surface temperature data sets, there actually was still an upward trend over this period. So where I'm coming at this approach and to revisit this period was thinking about it from a predictability standpoint, specifically through machine learning. And I wanna point out that while we look at predictability, we also apply some explainability methods to try to understand, you know, if our machine learning model is able to predict something like this type of slowdown, where is it looking? And of course, many of these studies have proposed all sorts of different possible mechanisms for the early 2000s slowdown. Some people have even proposed that it's a statistical construct, you know, of the different data sets used to measure the global mean surface temperature, but also other types of internal variability and external forcing in the climate system, specifically things like the interdecadal Pacific Oscillation or the IPO. Things like aerosol forcing or solar forcing are all possible proposed mechanisms in those hundreds of papers that have evaluated this, including many of the people attending uh, this call in the CSM workshop. So I want to go through sort of how we define a slowdown, and we're going to be using the CSM2 large ensemble. 
So I'll just start off thinking about one particular ensemble member, and we take one member from the CSM2 large ensemble, and we calculate the global mean surface temperature record. From that record, we then calculate 10-year moving trends. Again, this sort of is an arbitrary definition that we're using here for 10 years, and this could be adjusted for whatever type of purposes or how you want to define a slowdown. We can then graph sort of their slope. And again, you can see from this, you know, 1990 to 2000, there's this course, this interannual variability in the trend. And then we can define some sort of threshold for when the slope of those linear trends falls below a certain value. We can define that as a slowdown event. And that's sort of indicated by the red markers here. And then we can repeat this exercise for each individual ensemble member in CSM2 large ensemble, and then get a collection of these slowdown events for all of the ensemble members. We also importantly want to try to evaluate our framework using observations. So here I'm just showing one reanalysis data set from era five, showing again, we can calculate the global mean surface temperature and then 10 year linear trends and plot their slope there on the bottom. And then the dashed line indicates some sort of threshold for a slowdown event. And how we're defining the slowdown events is the year it begins. And I'll get into that into more detail when I describe our machine learning model. And so here's sort of the breakdown, you know, putting it all together for all of the ensemble members. The way we've created our definition here, um, as you can see by the histogram, we tend to have more slowdown events in the sort of early 21st century period and less slowdown events towards the end of the 21st century. And so we're turning to machine learning, um, which has been a growing topic, both for weather and climate science. Uh, you know, Emily gave a really nice introduction to the method here that we're using in neural networks, but really broadly speaking, machine learning is essentially just statistical methods that take a lot of data and then provide some sort of output as its prediction. And one reason we think machine learning might have a lot of opportunity in climate science is that it loves extracting and finding patterns in lots of data. And of course, in the climate model world and remote sensing world, we have plenty of data to play with, which really strengthens this idea of training and testing machine learning models. But one of the problems uh, or issues that, that people are hesitant for applying machine learning type methods is that it's sometimes called a black box and that we really don't know what the statistical methods are doing and how it's making its accurate predictions. And in recent years, we've been finding that using explainability methods from computer science have really been able to provide some sort of insight for how machine learning models are making their predictions and can actually show patterns, for instance, in climate science, that we can actually learn new science and use it sort of as a way to reveal climate patterns in the climate system. So I'll start off with our sort of machine learning model and how we approach this idea of slowdown events. We're going to use maps, global maps of upper ocean heat content and where each grid point then is going to go into an input layer of our artificial neural network. And then it's gonna go through two hidden layers, sort of that's where all this sort of black box type idea goes. It's a fully connected neural network. And then it's gonna output something where it's gonna be a yes or no. So this is a binary classification problem where it's gonna say in the next 10 years, Will the 10 year trend be a slowdown period based on our threshold, yes or no? And then we're gonna apply an explainability method to really understand, okay, if the neural network can make accurate predictions of these slowdowns, where is it looking in these global maps of upper ocean heat content? And sort of providing a quick proof of concept for how this explainability method works, let's think about something we already know like ENSO. And so imagine you set up a simple neural network that takes in maps of sea surface temperatures. And essentially it's the, the neural network, we ask it whether or not that current time period is observing an El Nino or La Nina, another binary classification problem. So then we can use this visual, visualization method. Specifically, we're gonna be using layer-wise relevance propagation, but there are many methods um, for explainability. And in the upper map here, you can see this global map and the output of the explainability method is a heat map. So the brighter colors indicate that region is more important for the neural network to make its prediction. In this example, whether it's an El Nino or La Nina. And then the bottom map, you can compare that with a composite of the actual sea surface temperatures. And you can see that they nicely align, that the explainability method is looking in the correct re region to make its correct predictions. 
And as I've already mentioned, there are many methods for explainability in machine learning, um, but they're not perfect. And, you know, uh, they provide sort of there's a, an own user interpretation, and it's often very valuable in machine learning to compare many of these methods. And again, they can be very useful for understanding what's going on in that black box and potentially learning new climate science along the way. So I'll return again just to emphasize what is our neural network. We input maps of upper ocean heat content from different ensemble members from the CSM2 large ensemble, and we ask the question whether the next 10 years will be a slowdown event, yes or no. And then we look at the explainability methods. So how well does the network do? So what I'm providing here is actually six different ensemble members from 1990 to the end of the 21st century. These are six ensemble members from testing data. So what that means is that the neural network trains on a set of ensemble members, but we leave these six aside. So the neural network hasn't already seen this. So it's essentially we're inputting data that it hasn't seen before and then asking our question whether it's a slowdown. So wrong predictions are in red, blue predictions are the correct ones, and white are the ones that are actual slowdowns that it misses. So the neural network is clearly not perfect. It is missing some predictions along the way, but it does get some of these periods of slowdown events. And that's what we're really interested in, these correct predictions. So now we can apply the explainability method to understand when it's making correct predictions, where is it looking? So these are heat maps from that a method called layer-wise relevance propagation. In the upper left, brighter colors indicate that that region of ocean heat content was more important for the correct prediction of a slowdown. We can then compare these on the right with actual composites of what the inputs look like for over ocean heat content. And then the yellow contours, again, that's those areas that the, the explainability method is showing that were important for the neural network to make its decision. So you can see that they often align with sort of this pattern in the tropical Pacific, but there are also other regions of the ocean, such as in the Indian Ocean and Southern Ocean, that were clearly important for the neural network to make its predictions. So what about observations? So we know that there is some skill actually in this setup. And again, we're just inputting maps of ocean heat content anomalies. We remove the force trend from those maps. So now we're curious, well, does this work on observations? And we can test this on this so-called hiatus period. So what you're looking at here is observational inputs of ocean heat content. The white bars, that was your sort of your onset, according to our definition of the early 2000s slowdown. And then the red dashed line is sort of the frequency of how often that period was classified as a slowdown event from a collection of neural networks. Essentially, those collection of neural networks, all we do is essentially scramble the training and testing individual ensemble members from CSM2. And we find that at least 50% um, of those 100 sort of scrambled neural networks predict a slowdown event actually when there was an early 2000s slowdown period. Also, what's interesting is sort of on the right hand side of this upper panel where the line of the dash line is even higher, indicating that the neural networks essentially are even more confident that a slowdown event for this sort of 10 year short period has actually begun. Um, right around the 2016 Super El Nino, and then going forward into the next 10 years. So that's interesting if because we now have a few extra years since 2016 to compare with the global mean surface temperature record. And it's actually been somewhat flat, as I pointed out earlier in the talk. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how this uh, performs going forward. But one of the takeaways here is that clearly our neural network was even classified in many of the ensembles of the neural networks, the correct prediction of the early 2000s slowdown, and it's even more confident that we are currently in one right now. So we can also return to that explainability method and then compare that using observations. So on the left-hand side, this is a composite map, the, the shaded colors are ocean heat content anomalies. The yellow contours are outlining from the explainability methods the regions of those ocean heat content anomalies that were important for the neural network to make its prediction in observations. And then on the right-hand side, sort of that's for the future prediction there. And we can see many of this familiar patterns we found from analyzing the climate model data also appearing in observations when it makes its prediction. 
And I'll just wrap here, sort of giving a broad takeaway of this. Although we provided sort of a simple sort of task of just thinking about global mean surface temperature record, we think there is a lot of exciting opportunities for using neural networks, particularly coupled with explainability methods for things like decadal prediction. And one really exciting part is by using the increasing and growing number of large ensemble simulations, you have plenty of data to play with for training and testing, um, which is really excellent for these types of methods. So my email is there and feel free to reach out and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. All right, thank you, Zach. Um, we are running right at our time limit. Um, so, and that, but there is a question in the um, chat window. And if others also have a question, have questions, please do put them in the chat window. Um, we'll move on to our next talk. Um, the influence of biomass emissions on ENSO and its teleconnections in CESM2. And our speaker is John Fasulo. Go ahead, John. How does that look? Good. Good. Okay, thank, thanks, Kathy. So this is an extension of work that we did last year and that we published on last summer, uh, looking at the climate response. Uh, initially, the work was to look at the climate response to the COVID-19 uh, emissions reductions and also the Australian wildfires. But we found the really interesting part of the story was the Australian wildfire uh, response. And so this is delving into some questions that were raised in that paper. Uh, my co-authors on the work are Nan Rosenblum, who has been a powerhouse in uh, producing these simulations, and uh, Re Rebecca Buchholz, uh, who has done a lot with the, uh, the wildfire emissions and, and their prescriptions in CESM2. So as we go into what might be our third La Nina year in a row, it's uh, interesting to provide some perspective on, on where we've been. And uh, it, it may be distant memory, but at the start of this event, actually, it wasn't clear at all uh, that we were going into a La Nina event. And so I highlight here, for example, the, uh, the NOAA discussion from June of 2020 and, and you know, the MEI of what we know happened is the bottom right here. And so this is right on the cusp of what might be a three-year La Nina event. And uh, the prediction was that we would have uh, and so neutral conditions actually through the following year. Uh, so it was not a very well uh, forecast event. Uh, it was given about a 60% chance of, of ENSO neutral. It ended up being a very strong and prolonged La Nina event. And part of that poor forecast may have come from the, uh, uh, the unique onset of the event. And obviously this La Nina did not follow on, on the heels of a, an El Nino event, um, but rather you know, instead of having this typical evolution in the ocean of, of Rossby waves hitting the Western boundary and reflected Kelvin waves up on Kelvin waves coming across the Pacific, uh, what happened was that, that the trade winds kind of intensified out of nowhere. Uh, and so a major question would be why, why did this happen in the absence of any Kelvin wave coming through? And then also in the absence of major SST anomalies. Um, and I think that our uh, simulations that I'll show actually provide an answer to this and that there was a, uh, an atmospheric connection between uh, the Australian wildfires and uh, conditions in the Eastern Pacific that may have increased the chances, at least, of the onset of a La Nina. Uh, and just to drive this point home, this is a tweet from Matt England last week. Uh, Mike, Mike McFadden had given a talk at uh, 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 University of New South Wales, which he was looking at current ENSO conditions. And April 2022, uh, SST anomalies in the Central and Eastern Pacific were at their coldest since 1950. Uh, and, and of course, that's despite the underlying uh, global warming signal. And so a very unique event, a very strong event, and our understanding that actually as to where it's come from has been pretty poor. So in what seems to be unrelated, but as I'll argue is not, um, this is a paper we did on Australian wildfires. Uh, the season of, 19, of 2019 to 2020, was an exceptional wildfire season in Australia. And that's illustrated by the, uh, the TV caption on the bottom left here, but really throughout Australia, above normal wildfire activity uh, and significant emissions, particularly off the East Coast of Australia and the Southeast Coast of Australia. And that's highlighted in the satellite image on the upper right here. And those emissions obviously did not stay over Australia, but really mixed throughout the Southern hemisphere. Um, and in CSM, that had major consequences for the energy budget and for ENSO. 
Um, but just quickly, the, the bushfire season was, it was the worst on record. So we have a real exceptional event here. And I think that's important in the sense to, to provide context for this event. It, it, it may be that you don't need to have biomass emissions in a prediction system to get these effects most of the time, but during unique circumstances, perhaps they're important. Um, and so in this season, over 60 million acres burned. Uh, for context, we have around 10 million in North America during a large season. Uh, 10,000 buildings destroyed, a billion animals killed, and I think around 3 billion displaced was the uh, estimate, and over 100 billion in damage. Um, and it was the costliest natural disaster to date. Um, so just to, to wrap up what we found in our, our study last year, uh, in uninitialized CESM2 runs, uh, we found that although the clear sky effects were actually pretty marginal, you know, on the order of a tenth of a watt per meter squared, the all sky effects were actually quite strong, uh, two to three watts per meter squared through the Southern hemisphere. Uh, and that actually resembled a major volcanic eruption. Uh, we know that major volcanic eruptions in the Southern hemisphere tend to trigger La Nina events and climate models. And so this is suggestive initially, at least of, of a connection between the two, although I think the mechanisms involved, and I'll show the mechanisms involved are probably quite different. Um, and you know, one of the side effects of having uninitialized runs is that there was a lot of accompanying internal variability with the forced response from these fires. And it made some of the features difficult to really um, identify with confidence. Um, and that was our motivation for using a, a different setup, an initialized setup similar to SMILE. So just quickly, some of these features were, you know, just nakedly obvious in the observations. Uh, top left, you can see aerosol optical depths for the globe for Northern Hemisphere and Southern Hemisphere. And those maxima you see in December of 2019 and into 2020 are the Australian wildfires. And so it was a maximum. These are average throughout the hemisphere. And these are maxima in the hemisphere for aerosol optical depth and cloud uh, aerosol radiative effect. Um, and that's to be expected with this huge emission of uh, uh, biomass into the Southern Hemisphere. We could equally see it in the all sky data. And so this figure on the bottom left looks at the contrast between the net flux between Northern and Southern hemisphere. And we reached an extreme value uh, in December of 2019 as well. That's coincident with that modus peak. So there's the suggestion at least that the all sky effects are, uh, are quite significant uh, even in the hemispheric means. And that uh, maxima was driven by Southern hemisphere cooling uh, in the observations. And then lastly on the right, uh, you can see how much noisier it gets when you look at regional features, but that uh, highlighted region in the Eastern Pacific is a region of enhanced albedo. And I'll argue that that's actually pretty important for the connection between the wildfires and ENSO. Um, so just quickly, the uh, simulations that we're using are kind of a, a modified version of the SMILE setup. I won't go through the SMILE details. I think figure people are familiar with it, but we're, our focus here is on the August 1st, 2019 simulations. Uh, which we increase from 20 to 30 members, and we also extend them to 36 months in length. Um, in addition to the default SMILE setup, uh, we've also created the SMILE Australian Fire Ensemble that's meant to match the SMILE setup. So we have 30 members of that. Uh, that extends for 36 months from August of 2019, and that's our real focus here. If you're looking for more information on CESM2, there's a, a manuscript highlight in the top right and on the SMILE Ensemble uh, on the bottom right. And so quickly, one of the things that we found was that with Australian fires, we had this persistent cooling in the tropical Pacific beyond what the SMILE Ensemble itself predicted. Um, there was some cooling predicted by the SMILE Ensemble, but a significant addition to that when we included the Australian wildfire emissions, and both of these match better with the eventual SST anomaly in 2021 um, when, we, when we include the, uh, the biomass emissions. And our goal here really is to try to get at what the mechanisms might be that connect these biomass emissions to ENSO. Um, and so this is identifying now a different pathway of interaction uh, beyond uh, ocean factors like uh, Kelvin waves and Rossby waves in the ocean. And what we found was that we could clearly identify, obviously, a signal in the burdens, uh, the biomass burdens. So on the left-hand side, you see a progression of uh, biomass burden anomalies, October, December, and February. And this gives you a sense, at least, for the evolution of the basic forcing um, and also the, the, the spatial extent of the forcing. Um, the emissions were greatest off the east coast of Australia, but really were quite high and detectable throughout the southern hemisphere, even in the Indian Ocean. Uh, and Atlantic Ocean, and um, they reached their peak generally in December of 2020. And so that's uh, actually in close agreement to what we see from MODIS, uh, where we can actually make, make fairly 
a good comparison between the observed fields and what we simulate. Um, and that pulse is really pretty short lived and it's largely gone by March of 2020. Um, associated with that pulse, and, and when those aerosol burdens reach the uh, uh, subtropical strato queue, is this brightening of the cloud decks. So this is something that we've computed called cloudy sky albedo. It's basically backing out the albedo of clouds from the all sky and clear sky fluxes, uh, taking into account the cloud amount. And what you find is that when those aerosols reach the, uh, the strato queue in the, in the eastern part of the basins, even in the Indian Ocean, actually, uh, you see a brightening of the cloud field. You can see a residual brightening really through the southern hemisphere off of Australia over through to the eastern Pacific. And this is primarily low clouds that are brightening because that's the vertical level at which uh, the aerosols reside. They do not really extend in, in significant quantities to the upper troposphere. Um, but the, these anomalies on the right actually last longer than the burdens themselves. And I'll argue that that's uh, related to some feedbacks that, that probably occur uh, in the Eastern Pacific Ocean. So radiatively, these are quite a punch. And like I mentioned before, in the hemispheric mean, we see anomalies of two to three watts per meter squared. Um, but regionally, actually, the anomalies are, are quite a bit higher. And so in the Eastern Pacific, this area really highlighted here, the anomalies are 15 to 20 watts per meter squared. And, uh, and they persist for a while. So beyond af after the aerosols are gone, uh, these seem to trigger feedbacks um, between the, uh, the stability of the lower troposphere and the SST cooling. Uh, and so they stick around for quite a while and they have broader environmental effects. And so on the left is the, uh, the radiation and on the right are the SST anomalies. And so you know some of the first regions where we see SST anomalies emerge uh, in response to these biomass emissions are these strato -Q decks. You can see it in the Indian Ocean, you can see it in the Pacific Ocean. And the SST anomalies actually get quite intense. Um, so almost a degree, um, you can see them, uh, they are statistically significant. The stippled regions are regions where it's not uh, significant, uh, greater than twice the standard error of the ensemble. Uh, and you can see over time, the SST, the negative SST anomalies kind of emerge from this area where the clouds were really juiced by the, uh, the biomass aerosols. Now that has an impact on the, the boundary layer moist static energy as well. And I'll show you this, the spatial structure of this in a bit, but this is the evolution of boundary layer moist static energy in that circle dot in the East Pacific. Um, and so as soon as the aerosols arrive, basically, you can see a pretty drastic drop, 2000 joules per kilogram of boundary layer moist static energy. And um, that continues for quite some time. And the argument I'm making is that this is important for ENSO because these are this, this region is basically upstream in the trade winds uh, from the deep tropics. And so these anomalies get evicted into the deep tropics and have an effect on both the ITCZ and also the MJO. And I think that those can influence the onset um, of ENSO. And so just to give you a sense for the spatial structure, the left-hand panel here is the near surface specific humidity and it's strongly tied to the moist static energy. And you can see the anomalies begin to emerge in this uh, Eastern Pacific region, but then are advected eastward and eventually into the deep tropics. And so by August of 2020, you really see this whole span of anomalies uh, that began in the Southeast Pacific, but um, was advected by the trade winds after that, and no doubt has begun to feed back onto the Walker circulation, uh, the MJO and the ocean by August. But um, the initial indication is that this region in the Southeast Pacific is really critical and, and the, the kind of the source region for these anomalies. Um, on the right-hand side, what you see is CAPE. And so that's the convective available potential energy uh, for the ITCZ and other deep convective phenomena like the MJO. Uh, initially, very few anomalies, but as this, you can you know, make a, a connection between the anomalies as they propagate in, in low level of humidity and moist static energy on the left with these CAPE anomalies on the right. And eventually you can see them propagate all the way over to the warm pool. And like I say, these are going to, in effect, displace the ITCT northward, which we see, I don't have time to show, but the rainfall belts uh, go to the north of these negative anomalies in CAPE. And then also one would imagine, we haven't actually looked at the high frequency data yet to, uh, to nail down the MJO behavior, but you can imagine that that's going to curtail the MJO propagation and the upwelling uh, Kelvin waves uh, uh, associated with that. Um, so just in summary, um, we see this connection between the wildfires uh, and aerosol burdens kind of throughout the Southern hemisphere. And when those aerosol burdens impinge on the uh, strato -Q decks, it increases their albedo, it, it drives this decrease in absorbed solar radiation and a decrease in SST. Um, and so together, I think this paints a picture of an atmospheric 
bridge, at least between the fires and the ENSO, um, that may explain why the 2021 La Nina event was so poorly forecast because it wasn't kicked off by uh, waves in the ocean, and then perhaps why it was so long lasting and why it continues to this day. Um, and I'll just stop there. Thanks. All right, thank you, John. Any questions for John, um, either in the raise your hand or in the chat window? Uh, Jerry, go ahead. Yeah, John, it's very interesting. So it is an interesting chain of connections across the Southern Hemisphere subtropics up into the, uh, the strata Q and then kind of going across the tropical Pacific. And I presume then you start invoking changes in the Walker circulation, right? Which would then intensify the La Nina. And I think you're arguing that it would have been a weak La Nina anyway, and it, this just made it stronger. Yeah, so I've highlighted it better in my text than I've said it, but one of the challenges here is that this, you know, this is the plausible connection of events, but certainly it's difficult to rule out uh, and even weigh the relative contributions of the various components. And so in one respect, the SST cooling in the Eastern Pacific may directly be weakening the Walker circulation, and that may be the root driver of it with these other anomalies being secondary. Um, but um, um, yeah, I, th I think I think there are at least two effects at play, and that is the direct cooling in the Eastern Pacific and uh, the moist static energy anomalies that go over. Um, and yeah, there, there is some component that is likely predictable from initial conditions alone. Um, I don't want to downplay that, and, and that may even be more important than these effects. There's a ton of internal variability, right, in this region, and it's really difficult to validate um, you know, the model or the prediction and say that one is necessarily right over another. Um, but this does seem to have juiced the event. And, um, you know, it's consistent with what we've seen with volcanic eruptions in models as well. And so um, the mechanisms are probably different, but the overall energy imbalance between the hemispheres is probably the same. Um, so I, I think it, it, it makes sense to conclude that both are at play. Great, thanks. All right. Thank you, John. We'll move on to our next talk, um, which is predictability of long-lived marine heat waves, a case study of the 2013-2015 Northeast Pacific. And our speaker is Evan Meeker. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for the introduction, Kathy. And uh, thank you, everyone, for being here today. My name is Evan Meeker, and I am a first-year graduate student at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, working with uh, Professor Elizabeth Maroon, uh, and today I will be presenting on the predictability of persistent marine heat waves, specifically looking at the 2013 to 2015 Northeast Pacific event in the seasonal to multi-year large ensemble. So I wanted to start by just giving an overview of marine heat waves, which can be described as discrete, prolonged, and anomalously warm events. Uh, this is a pretty broad definition, and it means that marine heat waves can occur over a wide range of spatial and temporal timescales. On the right, we have a schematic from Holbrook et al that shows this wide range uh, where you can have marine heat waves that are as short lasting as a few days uh, and as long lasting as over a year. I'm interested in these persistent marine heat waves, which are the longest lived and tend to be the largest spatial uh, marine heat waves. And these events overlap with uh, modes that we know contain predictability, such as ENSO and uh, oceanic Rossby waves. Marine heat waves are, also have dominant physical drivers that are spatially dependent and often time varying. For example, uh, strong El Nino events actually are considered marine heat waves, and we know that the physical drivers of that are going to be different than something that's happening in the mid-latitudes. Marine heat waves are also important because of their negative impacts, and the largest and most intense marine heat waves are associated with a huge number of negative impacts. Uh, and so this figure from Smith, Smith et al., uh, I'm not gonna go over it in detail, but I think it gets the point across that these events are well studied and that there's a large number of negative uh, consequences of these events. Uh, and so being able to predict them is a useful endeavor. So I'm going to be talking about the 2013 to 2015 Northeast Pacific Marine Heat Wave, which has received so much attention that it gets its own nickname, the blob. Um, and it's among the largest, most intense, and most persistent marine heat waves. Uh, you can see it from a time series uh, of SST anomalies. The event starts uh, around uh, summer of 2013, has a peak in January of 2014, and then lasts for over two years, depending on how you define it. Um, and I've got an animation of weekly SSTs uh, 
shown on the right here. And this is the same region that we're getting the SST anomalies from. And I want to point out that the blob is a non-stationary event. It starts in over the Gulf of Alaska region, uh, but then over the course of its existence, it progresses to the eastern boundary of the Pacific. Uh, and this is coinciding with a PDO phase change from 2013 to 2014. Uh, it's also linked with a strong 2015 to 2016 El Nino event, which you can see starting to show up here at the end of this animation. So I wanted to look, uh, highlight a couple of previous predictability works that have looked at the same thing. The first is this paper from Capitandi et al. Uh, that examines Northeast Pacific marine heat waves in general using a linear inverse model. And interestingly, they actually find a strong off equatorial sea surface height signal 12 months prior to the max marine heat wave strength in the Northeast Pacific. And this is, uh, this is interesting because they don't find nearly as strong SST signal, but they do have the strong sea surface height signal. Um, additionally, they find that Northeast Pacific marine heat waves may be a precursor to Central Pacific El Nino events. Second is uh, this paper from Jay Cox et al. Uh, that examined marine heat wave predictability using the North American multimodel ensemble. Uh, they find that uh, globally, the ENSO region has the greatest uh, skill in marine heat wave predictability uh, with significance at at least a 10 month lead. Notably though, the blob specifically was not predicted above a 10% chance, even just one month before the event uh, using the NME. So my re main research questions are how predictable are persistent marine heat waves? Uh, and I wanna look at the intensity and size and spatial pattern of the marine heat waves. And I also wanna look at their predictability prior to the onset of the event. And if you initialize after the onset of the event. And my second question uh, is what are the physical drivers that lead to marine heat wave predictability? So like I said before, I'll be looking at a case study of the blob uh, from 2013 to 2015 using the CSM2 SMILE prediction system. Uh, this consists of 24 month hindcast simulations that are initialized uh, in February, May, August, and November from 1970 to 2019. And I'll be using these colors to uh, signify those seasons. Uh, each ensemble is a, or each initialization is a 20 member ensemble initialized with JRA 55 atmospheric forcing and a forced ocean sea ice or FOSI model. I'm using a standard drift correction uh, with a 30 year drift drift climatology with the seasonal cycle removed. And I'm going to quantify the intensity of the blob using region, region average SST anomalies, as well as the extent and spatial pattern using pattern correlation. So I wanna start with some general results. Uh, and this is just a uh, SST uh, time series uh, with the observations from ERSST5 shown in the black line and from the FOSI in the red line. And the start of the blob is right here in uh, May of 2015. And I want to point out that the FOSI does a very good job overall, but you can see that during these periods of extreme su surface temperature anomaly, uh, there's a larger bias uh, in the FOSI compared to some of these other times. And so I wanted to look into this a little bit more. And so I went ahead and calculated the climatological uh, sea surface temperature bias. And we find a cold anomaly over the Central Pacific Ocean as well as a, a slight warm anomaly over the Eastern boundary. And I wanna point out that the, this is still a very small bias. This is around uh, 0.1 degrees Celsius, but it does interestingly uh, have a similar pattern to the CSM2 uninitialized biases, uh, although with a uh, different um, signal in the Kuroshio extension region. But this uh, pattern uh, on the Eastern boundary is very similar. Uh, however, looking at the biases during some of these peak events, we see that as opposed to 0.1 degrees Celsius changes, uh, where the blob is situated, there can be uh, SST biases that are over one degree Celsius. Um, and I haven't run the statistics on, on the difference here, but I, I think it's interesting to think about how these biases are represented specifically during extreme events, uh, as opposed to just like general uh, in the general run. Uh, so continue with general results, uh, I'm going to take a look at the anomaly correlation coefficient, uh, which sort of uh, measures the skill in uh, predicting the temporal variability. Uh, and we see that in the Northeast Pacific region, uh, we have a ACC over 0.5 at the 10 month lead in all of the initializations except for August. And we also see a reemergence of uh, ACC skill in 
the following fall for each of these ensembles. So first we have November, and then you see these peaks that kind of at three month intervals continue. Looking at the pattern correlation, which uh, is a measure of the skill of the spatial representation of the SST anomalies. Um, we also see uh, the same sort of signal at the beginning with February having the, the best spatial uh, skill in the long-term average. And we also see a skill retention over winter months. And so we see a flat line in skill corresponding with the winter of each of these initializations. So moving to the blob specifically, this is the same SST anomaly that I'm showing with the uh, January 2014 peak here. And our uh, these lines here are the member mean uh, smile hindcast for each 2013 initialization. And what we see is that all of these initializations, uh, even the November, November one initialized two months before the peak, don't, uh, don't show any uh, growth towards this peak. Uh, and in fact, the May and August initializations, which do start higher, uh, come back down to an anomaly of around 0 0.5. And this isn't just true in the, the mean, but if you look at the spread of all of the members, you see that even the spread uh, misses this peak by quite a wide margin, not just in the observations, but even if you're looking at the, the FOSI, it still misses the, the FOSI. And this isn't just, it's not just that this is true here, but if you go look at the full 50 year time series, uh, this is the only time where the spread of the uh, ensemble members misses the peak in this region. In contrast, we can see in 2014, once uh, the event has been underway, uh, we get a pretty good representation of the blob uh, in Smile Hindcast, with the means staying at around uh, one degree Celsius uh, positive SST anomaly um, in basically all of the initializations in 2014 and the spread encompassing uh, the, the observations fairly well. So moving on to the pattern correlation, um, I'm going to be comparing the November 2013 initialization to the May 2014 initialization. And on the top here, we have the uh, FOSI representation every three months. So this is starting in November 2013 and then going forward in three month intervals. Um, and then here's the Hindcast uh, representation. So what we can see is that unlike the FOSI, which has a blob that moves eastward with time, we initialize uh, the blob and then it just sort of stays in the same place uh, and slowly decays in intensity, but does not, we don't see this evolution uh, through time. Uh, we also see that there's a Central Pacific anomaly that shows up throughout this first year that's completely unrepresented in the Hindcast. Um, and going forward in time, what ends up happening is that this cold anomaly, uh, this uh, cold negative PDO-like signature that is shown in the first uh, month of the Hindcast, just kind of continues all the way throughout these two years. And at a certain point, this becomes the opposite uh, of what actually happens. So this transition is completely unrepresented in the November 2013 Hindcast. And uh, the result of this is that our pattern correlation uh, especially as you get around the one-year lead mark, is the lowest pattern correlation of all 50 November starts. Um, so this is a pretty significant miss and trying to get a little bit at why this is happening. So contrasting with the May 2014 uh, Hindcast, so again, this is the FOSI, and now I've just moved six months forward. So here's the uh, May 2014 and then moving forward. And we can see uh, that when the blob is initialized further east, uh, and when we initialize this cold anomaly that has started here, we actually get a very good representation all the way through two years. Uh, so mm, looking forward, we see that the, the evolution, although the, the values aren't quite matched, um, the, the pattern is very well matched. And even out at 20, lead 22, we're getting a pretty good transition here. And so I think uh, this goes along with uh, Emily's talk earlier about this positive to positive IPO or PDO phase. If we, if we have a positive phase started, it seems to hold on to it pretty well. And so this leads to a pattern correlation at leads 13 plus in, in May 2014 that's among the highest of all of the 50 years. So a stark contrast to the November 2013 starts. So in summary, uh, we find that in agreement with previous studies, uh, we find the that the intensity of the blob has low predictability prior to the January 2014 peak and smile. 
However, after the blob has migrated to the North American coast, so after that PDO sign change, uh, small hindcasts seem to lock in tropical and extra tropical Pacific SST anomaly evolution, which corroborates previous work. Uh, and I don't show it here, but preliminary examination of smile skill in the tropics suggests that this long lasting skill is not solely attributable to the tropics. You need some sort of extra tropical skill as well to be able to get this long lasting skill. And finally, the inability of the blob uh, or the inability to predict the blob before it settles on the North American coast suggests that there is an issue in predicting the transition from a negative PDO to a positive PDO. Uh, and with that, I want to thank you all for coming to my talk, and I'll take any questions if, they, if we have any. All right, thank you, Evan. Um, we're right at our time limit, um, and I do want to respect people's time for having a break as well. Um, so if you have questions for Evan, please uh, put that in the chat window. And we'll right, move on again. to our next talk. Um, our next talk is Robust Changes in North America's Hydroclimate Variability and Predictability, and the speaker is Sanjeev Kumar. Hey, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Let me, can uh, you see my screen? Yes, it's all good. Okay, be good. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about the robust changes in North America hydroclimate variability and predictability and co-author of uh, this presentation is Dr. Candida Davis and Dr. Matthew Newman. Okay, before I say anything, I wanted to say a word about a robustness. Um, this is a ability of any statistical method or the modeling exercise to not only work in, in your favorite condition, but also if there is slightly departure or slight update in the, in the model configuration, it should work. And it's, it's not a complicated concept. If, if you work with a non-normal data set, you can think about like a median is a more robust estimate than me. So this is overview of my talk. Uh, I'll go ahead and get started. Okay, so climate modeling works. Uh, two things I wanted to pay you attention here is this paper was published in 2008 and the study found, uh, yeah, I'm not a co-author here. And this study finds, uh, yeah, in, back in 2008, 15 years ago, uh, that there was a 50% 50, 50 chance of the lake meat to go dry by 2021. And here we are, like, uh, I'll show you some of the hard number as we go through this presentation. Okay, in the second, uh, in the introduction slide, is the, I will be using the soil moisture metric to quantify both the variability and predictability. It, it integrates a number of different climate processes, particularly related to land. And I will be focusing on the root zone, uh, roughly zero to one meter. And that has a uh, uh, more, more dynamics involved than the full layer that is uh, like a deep layer plus root zone. So I will be focusing on the root zone variability. With these two contexts, uh, what is the objective of this study is to first to investigate how the North America hydroclimate variability and predictability are changing. Um, then to understand what are its driver and then finally assess, uh, yeah, if we understand what are their driver, then how it can impact both the drought and pluvial risk under changing climate. So we are using two of the large ensemble data sets, CSMLE and GFTLCM3LE. And in the top panel, you see the how the precipitation variability is changing. So this is non-digital precipitation variability is increasing consistent in both the large ensemble. However, in the bottom uh, part of the slide, you see the soil moisture variability changes that uh, uh, does not increase as I would expect from the precipitation variability increase. And in fact, if you see some of the GFTL results, so projection are shown as a difference from the historical climate. Uh, so you, you see 
uh, there is a big decrease in the soil moisture variability, particularly in the higher latitude. And uh, CSM early has more of the mixed signal. So this is what we wanted to understand. Why does the soil moisture variability changes differently than the than the precipitation variability? To to understand this uh, soil moisture variability changes, we will be using a model called Redend and so framework where we model the soil moisture variability at annual time scale as a uh, previous year soil moisture uh, and then the current year and so. And this is a linear regression model. We um, will estimate both alpha and beta either from climate model or from the observation and then the corresponding noise term. So I wanted to introduce each of these terms one by one. So here is our uh, little formula. And then uh, this is the second term that is ENSO. So we take the SST in the tropical Pacific, uh, including Indo Indian Ocean. And then uh, we calculate the UF1. And you see the uh, ENSO signal there. And you also see in the uh, panel B, there are two vertical lines. Those are two major transitions that we have seen in the last 70 years in the Pacific. Uh, if you are not convinced with those vertical lines, what in the next uh, panel uh, uh, I've shown is the soil moisture variability from the ERA5 data set. And you, you see how, how there was a uh, multi decadal. Um, dry period before 77, 76, 76, 77, and then after that we went into the wet period and then again we are into the dry period. Um, if you overlay the lake mead water uh, record and that, that pretty much correspond to that uh, multi-decadal wet, dry, wet, and again dry period. Uh, so, uh, to, to model this hydroclimate, we need this memory component. Like if you calculate what is one year lag um, anomaly correlation for ENSO, it is 0.17, for soil moisture 0.41, and if you look into the lake meat record, it is 0.91. So uh, hydroclimate needs that uh, memory component. So we, we did this uh, red and ENSO framework model using the observation and you get a reasonable scale. And uh, I would say like this is comparable to what you would get for one year forecast in the DPLE. Uh, so with that, uh, uh, yeah, if, if we compare only ENSO only model or the memory only model, memory is the soil moisture part, uh, you, you see there is a skill coming from the ENSO component, but surprisingly, memory uh, component is contributing more than the ENSO component of the skill. Okay, so that was the observation part. Now we'll go back to our climate model to look into the future projection. And here I'm comparing the predictability signal to total ratio from historical climate to, to the future climate. And what you find that, yeah, um, there is strengthening of predictability, at least in the CSM alley in the Southwest. And there is somewhat weakening of predictability in the, in the Canadian plain. And that uh, weakening of predictability is uh, uh, more evident in the CSM, uh, in the GFTL uh, CM3 alley data set and again, uh, you, you see that um, high latitude predictability uh, decreases considerably in the GFTL mode. So since I had a little formula, so I can I can see which of the coefficients are increasing and decreasing. Again, in the CSM alley, alpha is the memory component, and you see, uh, yeah, there is a decrease in the alpha component if you take that color scale, and whereas the beta is the uh, ENSO component and then the beta strengthens slightly. Uh, again, in the GFTL, there was a big decrease in the predictability related to in the high latitude and it is mostly related to decrease in the alpha component here. And there is slight strengthening of, of the beta, uh, particularly in the, in the uh, con US. 
Okay, what uh, uh, what I was showing you here, this is very complicated plot, but let me walk you through. Uh, here I'm showing each of the ensemble member in both uh, CSMLE and GFTLCM3 LE, and in the top panel, it is how ENSO is changing in the bottom panel. Uh, there is a soil mass and memory and the potential evapotranspiration. So I think big part of the story is, yeah, when we take the ensemble mean, it provides some robust estimate, whereas the individual ensemble can show you very large or very small changes uh, that uh, that is totally possible due to the internal variability. Uh, both uh, ensemble members so both uh, large ensemble so similar changes there is an increase in the so variability and the decrease in the soil mass and memory that is related to the increase in the pet uh, so this is my final part of my presentation so we'll be going into the hydroclimate extreme and yet there is a limited uh, sample size problem so these kind of events like a 22 years of the drought, if you look into either observation or climate model data, you will find very limited sample in, in that data. So what we can do using this little equation, we can um, do 100 uh, uh, randomly generated sample, and then we can use this 100 sample to uh, investigate the robust changes in both uh, drought and pluvial risk. Uh, to see how, how does that um, the equation is working, uh, here uh, I'm showing the power spectra for both the uh, large ensemble and in the in the star symbol, you see what we get out of the climate model uh, from the respective climate model and in the setting region, what we get out of that uh, equation or the red and ENSO framework. So it, it provides more of a robust estimate compared to the uh, climate model. And you see that uh, um, particularly in the CSM alley, there is um, reddening of the soil moisture variability as we go into the lower frequency. Uh, some of those reddening are absent in the GFTL, and this may be related to the lower memory in the GFTL. And if you compare both historical and the future climate, there is slight strengthening of the ENSO-related variability in the CSMLE, not so much in the, in the GFTL. And uh, uh, particularly if you go to the high latitude, uh, the low frequency variability component is, is decreasing. So that brings me to the robust changes in drought and pluvial risk. Here, uh, again, uh, blue is the historical, yellow is the future detrended. So when we compute the variability, we can remove the trend. However, we can also add back the trend uh, to assess uh, how the future changes, uh, which of the component is driving the future changes. So that is what uh, is shown in the red color with the uh, um, with trend, and we add back the trend in, into that uh, red and ENSO framework. And what we surprisingly find, or maybe not so surprising, uh, is is uh, both that uh, yellow and the blue color mostly overlap each other. And then only when we add the trend, you get the changing drought and pluvial risk. And this is also depicted by these two numbers. Uh, first number correspond to changes in the risk uh, due to uh, variability component only. And then second number represent the changes in the risk uh, due to both the variability and the mean component. So only when uh, you, you include that mean component, you see most of the uh, drought or pluvial risk in the, is changing. So we, we did the same for all the three region. And here uh, for both drought and pluvial condition, and here I wanted you to pay attention only when to the all the red curve. So only red curve are considerably different from the blue or the yellow curve. So that finally brings me to the conclusion that uh, yeah, North America hydroclimate is changing. Mm, soil moisture variability is small. Uh, despite increase in the precipitation variability. Um, 
uh, two, two characteristics are uh, increasing ENSO variability and the decreasing soil moisture variability. It uh, may affect uh, how the North America hydroclimate variability and predictability are changing. And one of the conclusion we can draw from this modeling exercise is, uh, yeah, future drought and pluvial risk are primarily driven by the mean state changes. So if you are doing the infrastructure planning, you can robustly if you know how much the mean state is going to change, uh, going to change, you go ahead and incorporate those changes, and it is likely to be robust uh, in in the coming decade. Thank you. You're muted, Kathy. All right, so we are now at our break time. Um, and so if you have questions for Sanjeev, please um, do put those into the chat window. Uh, we will return uh, for um, the rest of our talks at um, 10.30. Um, and uh, before we do that, I'd like to thank all of our um, morning speakers um, uh, in the first session here. Um, and um, I will see you all again 10.30. And don't forget also at 11.30, um, we will be having discussion of uh, brainstorming of new simulations. So thank you speakers and see you at 10.30.
Hi, Kathy. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you. How are you? Great. How are you? Good. Congratulations on your new position. Oh, thank you so much. Um, and welcome. I'll also give you a heads up. Um, well, I'll share this with everyone when I start. Um, I'm okay. at an in-person conference that I'm co-chairing. So um, hopefully, it's <laughs> 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 so smoothly here. <laughs> Trying to do too many things at one time. <laughs> the new normal. <laughs> uh, hybrid has empowered us <laughs> too much. <laughs> <laughs> yes. All right, you can go ahead and share your screen and I will uh, start off our um, session. Great, thank you. All right, welcome back everyone. Um, I see we have, uh, looks like 52 participants logged in. So hopefully everyone's um, returned from, uh, from their break. Um, our speaker uh, is Maria Molina and she'll be talking about machine learning based assessment of the representation and predictability of North American weather regimes. Um, go ahead, Maria. Thank you, Kathy, and um, hello, everybody. Um, it's so wonderful to um, see everyone virtually um, here for uh, the CESM uh, event. And I uh, want to share that I am currently in Kansas City, Missouri uh, for a, another workshop. This is the AMS Early Career Leadership, Leadership Academy. Uh, so this is why I'm wearing a mask uh, and, um, and hopefully there are no interruptions, but, um, but please be aware that that may occur. Uh, as I'm co-chairing this event and sometimes things um, come up last minute. Um, but I'm really excited to be here with you today and share um, this work. Again, as Kathy mentioned, it's titled uh, Machine Learning Based Assessment of the Representation and Predictability of these North American Weather Regimes. And essentially the motivation for this project came about because uh, we know that predicting uh, temperature and especially precipitation on longer lead times, such as weeks three, four, five, six, can be really challenging. And there are really some high impact events that have occurred in the past, um, some extremes um, on those time scales. And so here we're asking whether we could potentially gain uh, some additional insight and hopefully predictability uh, to these precipitation and temperature anomalies on those longer time scales by assessing uh, North American weather regimes. And this is work uh, conducted in collaboration with Yaga, Sasha, Katie, Judith, Aishu, and Jerry, many of who are um, on this call today. Uh, but here I have uh, these uh, figures. These are from uh, Yaga's recent paper assessing the um, prediction skill of um, CSM1 and CSM2 and various different versions of uh, these models, um, looking at the skill as we head into these longer lead times. So again, from weeks three to six, uh, we can generally see that, as we know, temperature skill is generally higher than precipitation skill. And precipitation skill really is poor uh, once we get into these longer lead times. But as um, Kathy has actually so eloquently mentioned uh, in a recent paper in 2019 in BAMS, um, you know, we really could gain a lot of knowledge um, or, uh, yeah, provide a lot of value to stakeholders uh, such as water resource managers, um, energy sectors, and et cetera, uh, if we were to have skillful prediction of these anomalies as we head into those longer lead times. So this has a substantial societal value. Um, and as we know, um, historically marginalized communities really do um, experience disproportionate vulnerability to extremes. And so this could be extremes in the form of temperature anomalies with uh, heat waves or cold snaps and also uh, precipitation anomalies. You know, if they experience extremes in terms of flooding or other events, um, really we know that these marginalized communities do experience the brunt of this uh, disproportionately to others. But uh, again, if we can provide additional value um, with uh, knowledge of these anomaly events that are forthcoming, that would be of um, a really imp a high impact. Uh, and so essentially what we're doing here is, you know, instead of predicting these precipitation or temperature anomalies outright, we wanted to ask whether we can assess the uh, predictability of these large scale patterns uh, in the atmosphere. And so this is not a new idea. This has actually been around for quite some time, several decades. We have numerous publications here and that is not an exhaustive list. 
uh, but we do know that um, these persistent large-scale patterns in terms of uh, when we look at geopotential height anomalies at 500 hectopascal, uh, these patterns are very persistent. And because they're so persistent, we do end up seeing these anomalies um, projected onto the surface in terms of temperature or precipitation anomalies. And so again, maybe there's some value that we can gain there. Uh, and so essentially what we did is we followed a lot of the previous literature, uh, looking at k-means clustering algorithms and um, essentially just taking some reanalysis product. And in this case, we're focusing on era five. Uh, so using numerous decades of data actually from uh, the 90s and uh, training this algorithm using um, this data to extract what these um, persistent large-scale patterns are over North America. Uh, and so here we have the plot on the right-hand side. We see that uh, we have uh, numerous patterns that emerge, and these are very consistent with past literature. Uh, so we generally see this Alaskan ridge pattern where we have high pressure that's very persistent over Alaska, and then, um, and then a, a shift into negative um, geopotential height anomalies. Then we have this Greenland high pattern where high pressure is very persistent over Greenland. And despite how far north that is, we still see a pattern projected onto um, uh, the US. And over the Pacific trough, uh, this is our third weather regime here. Uh, again, low pressure over um, the Alaska region and, and North Pacific. And we also see this uh, pattern emerge which is high pressure along the west coast of the US. And so what we do here is we can assess, first we can assess the representation of these patterns in our numerical prediction system. So in this case, we're using an Earth system model, CESM2. Uh, these are um, forecast initialized um, and then going out to about week six. And we can assess the percent um, of occurrence of these patterns in the CSM prediction system. And so we see that overall, um, the percentages are generally very similar when you compare them to that um, of uh, frequency of occurrence over era five. And we also see that generally spatially, these patterns are also very consistent. Although we will note that as we head into later lead times, we do notice that the anomaly magnitudes do decrease um, in uh, magnitude. Uh, so we see again, some uh, weaker anomalies in uh, geopotential height as we head into later lead times. And as I mentioned, uh, these patterns do uh, project a pattern onto the surface in terms of weather conditions. And so here we're looking at precipitation anomalies over North America. And we can see that for the West Coast high pattern, um, geopotential height anomaly pattern, uh, when we look at the surface and precipitation anomalies uh, for weeks three, four, we see drier conditions where we have generally very persistent high pressure and um, above average precipitation anomalies over the southeastern US. So again, providing us with some value and overall uh, CESM2 does a, a really good job at um, representing this, but we do see some um, uh, anomaly uh, biases where we have weaker anomalies in the CESM prediction system. And that again is also uh, partly a function of lead time. During earlier lead times, we see magnitudes for these anomalies are higher. And then as uh, lead time increases, we see uh, dampening of those anomaly magnitudes. But again, here we have uh, NOAA CPC, uh, and we have um, our Air 5 product and then a comparison with CSM. And generally, we're seeing at least the sign of the anomalies um, co-located in correct locations. And very similarly as well for um, temperature. Um, so then we can ask other questions of um, this work. So for example, we can ask, OK, if we started in a certain weather regime uh, in, in terms of our initialized forecast, how likely is it that we will stay in that weather regime as we go forward in time? Because we said, you know, these are very persistent patterns. And so what we did here is we just went ahead and looked at the duration of time that we spent in a weather regime. And then we looked at the frequency of um, how, uh, you know, how often that duration occurred. And overall, it turns out that the West Coast high pattern generally tends to have um, higher frequency during um, shorter duration, but also we can see these um, events here at the tail end um, sticking out as compared to other weather regimes. So for example, again, to uh, more clearly state, uh, weather regime four, uh, we look at longer duration um, and we can see certain events that actually can last uh, for multiple weeks. So in the past, at least in our uh, uh, CESM data and era five product, 
there are certain weather regimes that can persist beyond two weeks. So that would offer us potentially some predictability were we to start um, our initialized prediction um, at that weather regime. Hopefully that made sense. Um, and so here we can also assess um, the skill in um, predicting these weather regimes. So we can compare to era five, uh, our CESM2 forecast. And as we head into um, later lead times, we again generally see a decrease in skill as we would expect, um, but overall um, not too bad, I guess. But by unfortunately by week two, you do see a big drop in ACC when you're comparing to era five. Um, to further assess representation of weather regimes and also um, predictability. So here, if we were to look at day zero, um, this could be our assessment of um, the skill in CESM2. And we see that overall, the um, percentage of days that are spent in a weather regime uh, for either one of these um, products, so again, ERA5 or CESM2, they're generally very consistent. So this gives us some confidence in the representation of these patterns within CESM2. But as we head into later lead times, we see a bias emerge, right? So here we have our West Coast high weather regime uh, over occurring. Um, during later lead time. So, um, so this is a, a, a bias that emerges from our analysis. Um, and when we're looking at predictability, we can also look at this in a little bit of a different way. When if, you know, uh, in these previous plots, I've been showing you um, the 11 member ensemble mean for CSM2, but then we can also look at the weather regimes within individual ensemble members. And then we can look at that as a function of lead time. And so here what I'm showing, uh, which this plot is a bit confusing, uh, but here on the top, we have the Alaskan Ridge. On the bottom, we have the West Coast High regime. And what we're seeing here on the X axis is the lead days. So we're going forward in time. And here we have a frequency. So we're seeing um, how many times the um, ensemble members really agreed frequently. Um, and so during earlier lead times, we have high agreement or higher agreement for the West Coast High uh, regime as compared to the Alaskan Ridge. And as we head into later lead times, we still have generally higher agreement for the West Coast High regime among ensemble members as compared to the Alaskan Ridge or even some of the other weather regimes. So this offers us some insight uh, into um, the predictability of different regimes. And we learn that our West Coast High regime tends to have higher ensemble agreement. So there's lower spread among the 11 ensemble members. And, um, and we also just generally are you know, again, seeing higher predictability. Uh, the blue and the black uh, bars show um, our uh, comparison between CSM2 and ERA5. So here where um, the higher the black lines are, the, um, the more agreement there is with the CSM2 prediction. Uh, so this is, um, again, we're seeing some correct forecasts even during later lead times. Um, and then we can look at individual forecasts as well. So this is also a bit confusing of a plot. Um, I'm sorry, I was a little too ambitious with um, the limited time I have and how to explain these. Um, but here we're looking at one forecast that was initialized on November 9th, uh, 2015, or using data from November 9th, 2015. And, um, and during early lead times, we see that CESM2 predicted our West Coast high regime. So we're starting in that fourth weather regime. And that prediction is correct because CESM also has, um, or ERA5 also has a West Coast high regime. Um, then we see spread, so a reduction in ensemble agreement and we see an incorrect uh, forecast eventually. So our CESM2 and ERA5 products are not agreeing um, in the shade of the um, weather regime. But suddenly as we head into weeks, um, uh, you know, beyond lead day 20, uh, and we're looking at now about week three or four or so, um, we see that ERA5 and CSM2 agree on the weather regime. So it's some sort of ensemble realignment. And while it is true that this could potentially happen by chance, uh, we decided to um, go ahead and look at fields that are located upstream of North America. And so here we're considering a North Pacific region and also the, um, um, you know, an area of interest for the MJO. And we actually see an increase in ACC skill during the same time period. So this would suggest that, you know, if we have outgoing long wave radiation better represented over the North Pacific, upstream 
stream of a um, North American weather regime, then perhaps we could actually see some um, lower spread in our ensemble members. Um, but again, looking further upstream as far as like the source of this higher skill in outgoing long wave radiation over the North Pacific. I'm still not sure, I can't give you an exact answer on that, but it was promising to see that this um, ensemble realignment or ensemble agreement occurring during a later lead time, uh, despite there having been a lot of spread during earlier lead times, did coincide as well with some other physical fields um, showing better skill. Um, and so here, this is another plot, just generally looking at what these, um, at, fields look like upstream. So here we're looking at outgoing long wave radiation, the North Pacific region that we're considering um, in blue and our um, tropical region for the Madden Julian oscillation across um, uh, in this black polygon. Um, but there are other ways to think about predictability. Of course, this is just one way and you may still ask, you know, uh, potentially what's the value of looking at um, weather regimes um, if um, that may not offer you skill at all locations um, throughout North America or other areas of interest. And that would be true, right? We may not have necessarily certain anomalies projected onto the surface in terms of uh, temperature or precipitation. And so we can also think about bias correcting um, our CESM2 output. And so we do have a project that um, is spinning up and uh, this is in collaboration with Katie um, and others that are listed on this project as well, um, as well as um, across other labs of NCAR. And, um, and so we're going to be working on using a unit to bias correct the CESM2 uh, predictions. And so we look forward to uh, sharing updates on that once, um, once that uh, continues. Uh, so with that, um, I will um, go ahead and stop talking and uh, apologies if that was a bit uh, chaotic or if you heard a lot of uh, shuffling in the back or setting up lunch here. Uh, but I will say, um, I will also say that I have a, new uh, ton of respect for uh, workshop and conference organizers. Uh, and, um, and just want to thank you all for the opportunity to chat with you today. And um, if you have any questions, please do feel free to um, email me. Great, thank you, Maria. Um, we don't really have much time for questions. Um, so I'm going to move on to the next talk, but please do email uh, Maria or also um, you can put questions or um, comments in the chat window. Um, um, that she can respond to later. Um, so our next talk is, did stratospheric variability drive the extreme cold air outbreak in the United States in February, 2021? And our speaker is Nicholas Davis. All right, great. Can you see that all right? Yep. Can you make it okay, a little cool. bit bigger? It's kind of small. It's a sort of taking up a, only a small uh, part of the screen. Okay. okay, sure. Let's try that. Yeah, I think that's a little bit better. Is good? Yep. Right, okay, go great, thanks. Um, hi, I'm Nick Davis. I'm uh, from the uh, Chemistry Observations and Modeling Laboratory here at NCAR. Um, this is work that I've done with Yaga, Sasha, Jim, and um, also Emerson LaJoy from NOAA CPC. Uh, and I presented part of this work last year focused on the sudden stratospheric warming in 2021. Uh, but this year, I'd like to focus uh, on the extreme cold air outbreak in February 2021 with a similar set of experiments. So um, this is just to orient everyone. Um, I'm sure you remember last year, if you were anywhere in the Great Plains, the Mountain West, or the Midwest, uh, you experienced some severe extreme cold last February. So starting in early February and then continuing into late February, this blob of extreme uh, low temperatures extended. Nick, I'm sorry to interrupt, but um, we can't, we did not see the slide advance. So we're still seeing your title slide. Lordy, okay. <laughs> there we go. Let me, let, me, let me try and just share the whole screen and maybe that'll work. Cause I, I imagine you're seeing the PDF right now. Yes. Okay. All right, so can you see a figure <laughs> and it advanced? Okay, great. So this cold extended over the period in February down from Alaska and Canada 
uh, towards Texas, and in some cases plunged temperatures over 30 degrees C below their climatological anomaly. Uh, it led to hundreds of deaths and billions of dollars in infrastructure damage. So this was a this was definitely an extreme colder outbreak. Um, now, in terms of weather regimes, um, colder outbreaks tend to be more likely after a sudden stratospheric warming, and there was one in January of last year, but they are most likely when the polar vortex is stretched. So this happens, this is a disturbed polar vortex. You can think of it as a wave one kind of shape where it's stretched out and elongated over the Atlantic. And this did occur in February, 2021. The polar vortex was stretched out over the Atlantic and it looked to have reflected planetary waves back down to the troposphere. The mechanism is, I think, relatively simple. The idea is that these waves are generated over Eurasia. They go up, they reflect off the vortex, and then they deposit their, uh, they, they apply drag on the flow and increase wave amplitudes in the troposphere, which invigorated the trough and made it intensify the cold air outbreak. They also are, this mechanism is also hypothesized to connect extreme weather to Arctic amplification. And so we really wanted to take a experimental approach to understanding this extreme event rather than a statistical approach. So we looked at the CSM2 Wacom 6 uh, real-time forecasts. So there are 21 members initialized every Monday as part of the NOAA SubX project. Um, the details are described in Yaga's recently published paper in weather and forecasting. And that's kind of this panel on the top. Standard forecast where the troposphere and the stratosphere and the land service are initialized. Here we're looking at initializations on February 1st and 8th. And from that, we can characterize variability and predictability, uh, but we don't really have hypothesis testing, right? If you're trying to attribute the extreme cold to stratospheric variability, it's pretty, it's, it's pretty difficult to do in a standard forecast because you're just getting the stratospheric variability that occurred. Um, so what we did is drop down into what I'll call the attribution zone, where we performed initial condition scrambling experiments. So in these cases, we let the initial conditions drift either in the troposphere or in the stratosphere. And in letting them drift, uh, we essentially deny mechanisms from occurring. So for instance, when we scramble the tropospheric initial conditions, we let a new troposphere develop, but with the same vortex stretching and wave reflection uh, in observations. And that gives us some insight into the direct impact of vortex stretching and wave reflection. On the other hand, if we let the stratosphere drift and we prevent that vortex stretching and wave reflection from occurring, um, what that gives us is insight into the impact of the tropospheric circulation and total isolation from that mechanism. So what you can think of is the scrambling procedure is like a direct hypothesis test. You're, you're leveraging the model to unveil the hidden physics in the system. Basically, what would have happened during the cold air outbreak if there was no vortex stretching and wave reflection, but everything else was the same. And what I think that does, and it's important to highlight is it aligns our experimental scope at the process level that we're interested in. If we're arguing about the troposphere versus the stratosphere, we should be doing experiments on the troposphere and the stratosphere. So um, here's what the forecasts over the North American land surface looked like during the peak of the cold air outbreak. So on the far right is Meritu from 1980 to 2020. And then the dotted red line is the event. So the event had an average minus 5.5 C anomaly over all of North America. That's Canada, Alaska, and the United States. Um, that's the coldest event in Meritu for this time of year. It's pretty extreme. The forecast that we initialized on February 1st and February 8th, here I'm just calling the standard forecast, they predicted somewhere between minus three and minus 3.5 C with some members matching the verification. So we're not in an ensemble mean sense capturing that extreme cold, but we are forecasting the second or third most extreme event on record and some members are doing that. When we scramble the stratospheric initial conditions and prevent the vortex stretching and wave reflection from occurring, um, we don't see any impact on the forecast at all. So whether you let the initial conditions drift on the first or the eighth, um, 
you, you have no impact on skill for the event, which is kind of interesting. Um, when you actually let the tropospheric initial conditions drift, you end up with extreme warmth, which seems to suggest that the direct impact of that vortex stretching and wave reflection would have instead been extreme warmth given a different troposphere. So this is, this is weird if, <laughs> if that vortex stretching and wave reflection matter for the event, you should see it in the forecast. So let's figure out what's going on. So um, for those that are not dynamically inclined, I'm not gonna get into any big, big details here. I'll keep it really simple. And I think a simple perspective anyway is all you need to understand what exactly is going on. So on the top panels here in A and B, I'm showing you the 100 millibar geopotential height anomalies. And also in shading, showing you where there's net upward and downward wave activity. So where are planetary waves traveling upward from the troposphere and then going downward uh, back down to the troposphere. And so you can see that the vortex had some very high anomalies um, over Siberia and some low anomalies, especially later in the period, February 7th, 12th, over the Atlantic. And the wave activity flux is upward out of Eurasia and downward over North America, okay? Consistent with the mechanism. And we see that continue later into the period. The ensemble mean forecasts capture that in the early part of the period, not so much at all in the late part of the period, which could explain why our forecasts maybe didn't get such extreme cold, but I'll get back to that in a second. When we look at the run where we scramble the stratospheric initial conditions, what you can see is that there's basically no wave activity flux at all going on in the stratosphere. And if anything, we just see broad upward transport of wave activity on the later part of the period. So there's no wave reflection in the forecast with scrambled stratospheric initial conditions. So what that means is our mechanism denial experiment is effectively preventing this mechanism from occurring. But if there's no wave reflection, the obvious question is how is the surface forecast unchanged? And I think it's actually a really simple story. I don't even think you need these special forecasts to understand um, perhaps why this wave reflection process wasn't relevant for this event. So here I'm showing you a sort of zonal slice average between 45 and 75 north of this wave activity flux. So the vectors are showing you where the wave activity is going. The streamlines are also showing you that wave activity flux. And I'm going to argue that the streamlines are the most important part of these plots. And the tropopause here is shown in the white lines. Um, and then of course the background zone means little wind is shown in the shading. So you can see that in Mera 2, there was definitely a lot of upward wave activity flux out of the troposphere. There was also a lot of wave activity flux reflected down towards the troposphere. However, the streamlines just above the tropopause in that trough over North America are sort of a capping streamline for where the wave activity flux is coming from. And what it indicates is that the wave activity that went on to intensify the cold air outbreak in the trough never traveled above 200 hectopascals. It never really reflected off the tropopause. It just sort or sorry, off the polar vortex, it just sort of propagated up from the troposphere, traveled along the tropopause, and then deepened the, the trough. So essentially, yeah, there was wave, wave reflection, but that wave reflection uh, resulted in waves that traveled downstream of the trough. And you can see that we do shut down most of that mechanism in our, our initial condition scrambling experiments. But again, because that mechanism doesn't seem to be important, shutting it down doesn't have any impact on the surface temperature forecast. Um, so just a quick summary, vortex stretching and wave reflection don't appear to have played a role in the February 2021 cold air outbreak. Um, we think that's supported by our initial condition scrambling experiments, which prevented that mechanism from occurring. You get the same temperature forecasts. But I think it's also supported by the Mera 2 uh, verification output. And the key, I think, is to make sure that when you analyze a vector field, you have to properly scale it. Um, not just geometrically for your plot, but physically, especially when you do different uh, vertical coordinates. And I would say that streamlines really help constrain your interpretation of vector fields. They kind of 
it's easy to imagine what's going on when you look at a vector field, but the streamlines really tell you where, where things are going and ending up. And finally, just to pull things back, I think this kind of approach of scrambling the initial conditions is a really decisive attribution tool that allows the model to fill in the world that would occur without the mechanism or process in question. Um, and if you're interested in details of this part of the study or the sudden stratospheric warming, uh, it was just recently published in March on uh, Nature Communications. So thank you. Appreciate the, the time to share this today. Great. Thanks, Nick. Um, please put questions for Nick in the um, chat window. Um, and uh, we'll move on to the next uh, speaker. Um, land surface initializations contribute most to the subseasonal soil moisture forecast skill. And our speaker is Yanan Yana Duan. And if I said your name incorrectly, please do feel free to correct me. I will see my screen. Uh, yes, okay. it's, uh, it's in edit mode. So if you'll put it in presenting mode, that'd be good. All right, good. Yeah, we can see it. Uh, you can see the the, sh the showing mode or the smaller smaller windows. Which one? It's it's in the full view. Full okay, okay. Full view. Yep. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My research topic is land surface initializations contribute most to the subseasonal soil moisture forecast skill. We thanks to the USDA grant for supporting our research and uh, thanks to the collaborator, Dr. Richter, for help with data and for sharing her slides at the CSM co-chairs meeting. The soil moisture data we use is SubX CSM2 hand cards and full cast experiments. The soil moisture observation data set is uh, ERE5. We study the soil moisture predictability from ocean, land, and atmosphere. And we also study the predictability in each national ecological observation observatory networks, the NEO domain. Finally, we compare the CSM2 CAM6 model with other two sub-X models. The table shows three different, different initialization method for the CSM2 CAM6. The first method is control experiment. We use the, uh, we um, initialize the atmospheres, ocean and uh, land models with um, corresponding reanalysis method, a uh, reanalysis data set. The atmosphere model is initialized using the NSAP CFS V2 reanalysis. The ocean part is initialized using the adjusted Japanese project state fields and fluxes. The land model is uh, initialized by the 700 year spin up method um, used with a model CRM5 with atmosphere forcing from the CFS V2. The second method, we, it, uh, they initialize the model, uh, ocean part and the uh, land part. For the climatology, for the atmosphere models, uh, they use climatology to initialize it. And the last method is uh, land initialization only, and uh, they use the ocean and the atmosphere climatology to initialize the ocean atmosphere model. The, the CAM6 model, a uh, handcard forecast was launched for, uh, was launched on each Monday. So we have the three dimension forecast with five weeks, 12 months, and 33 years from 1999 to 2021, with forecast laid from zero to 45 days. The reference data side is ERE5. The ERE5 land soil moisture is a real analysis data side based on the numerical integrations of the ECM WF land surface model. The core model is carbon hydrology tailed ECMWF scheme for surface exchange over the land. The priority of the ERE5 land soil moisture is uh, the model resolution compared with the former ERE5. So the resolution is uh, nine kilometers and uh, so they have the hourly data side. The forecast evaluation method is a standardized soil moisture and then calculate the normal correlation. Standardized method is, uh, uh, consists of four steps. The first step, we, will, uh, we calculate the 
ensemble members mean, and we calculate the 40 days moving average along the forecast late dimension. And then we calculate the mean, the standard deviation along the year dimension with late and initialization time dependency. And we calculate the standardized um, forecast anomaly and calculate the, the anomaly correlation we have. So um, here's a result we have for the CAM6 road zone soil moisture correlation of um, the or we call the forecast scale in this figure. We divided the, the forecast into three columns. The first column is the control experiments with the all part initialized component. And the middle part, we only have the ocean land initialization. And for the last column, we only have the land initialization and we have the ocean and atmosphere climatology to initialize their specific specific model component. So each for each row, so for each row, we show the first two weeks forecast skill, the second two weeks and the third two weeks. We find that the land initialization provide most of the soil moisture predictability. And uh, compared with other part, uh, it seems like the ocean ocean model initialization provides a predictability along the coastal regions and part of the coastal regions. The seasonality is a soil moisture forecast scale for the three to four weeks was shown here, is shown here. And uh, compared with the formal figure, the difference is that we uh, show the forecast scale for four seasons. And uh, it is the same for the column definition the definition is that the different model initialization method for the CAM6 zone soil moisture forecast scale in this figure, we find that the atmosphere initialization provides predictability along the coastal region and the central continent, part of the central, central continent region. The land initialization provides most of the soil moisture predictability in the four seasons. Uh, we get the conclusion from uh, the third column since it, uh, the model only initialized with the land initialization and the soil moisture correlation is greatest in the Great Plain and the central southern US. We find that for the four seasons, the soil moisture correlation distribution is relevant to the rainfall zone in the four seasons. We, based on the formal figure, we calculate the area weighted correlation for each ecoregion. We find that for the ecoregion number six, the agricultural regions are most predictable and almost all predictability is coming from the land sources. And also with uh, the similar, I think the second, second largest correlation should be found in the site number nine, which is located in the north, Great Plain in the US because the three lines are from the three different initialization method. There is no obvious difference, especially in the site number six. So it means no matter we use the only land initialization method or we include the ocean, ocean and land. And uh, if we use all the initialization, there, there are overlap with each other after the 20, 20 days late forecast. Um, uh, this ship fire is uh, the neon domain region. To make sure our comparison uh, is robust and not depend on the specific sub X model we selected, we also compare the CAM6 forecast with other sub X forecast. Um, the two other models, um, ESRL and RSMAS CCSM4. We removed the climatology along the 23 years from 1999 to 2021, and then calculate 40 days moving average. And uh, we calculate correlation for each grid point in the US continent region and calculate the area weighted correlation to get the, uh, to get the three lines. We find all the correlations are significant with 0 0.05 level and the ER, ESRL correlation is greater than the CCSM4 and greater than the CAM6. And after the 22 days late forecast, the sub-X CCSM4 overlaps with 
um, CC uh, CAM6. We should pay attention that the ESR only provide forecast with one to 32 late, 32 day late. The conclusion, um, um, I, sum, I summarize briefly of the study until now, the sub X land model initialization provides most of the land, most of the soil moisture predictability. The soil moisture correlation is greatest in the Great Plain and Central Southern US. The, for the specific neo regions, the soil moisture in agricultural regions, uh, co, co, the co region number six are the most predictable, and almost all predictability is coming from the land sources. Compared with two other sub X models, the ESRL and the CCSM4, both of them have similar forecast trends with the uh, CAM6. Okay, uh, that should be the all we all I have now. Great, hey, thank you. If you have questions, you can put them in the chat window or raise a hand. I don't see questions. We do have a little bit of time. So um, I'll ask a question. Um, so I see that you compared with um, two other sub X models. Um, is there a reason why you chose those particular ones? And, um, and um, have you considered including some of the other models? Um, the reason is that I um, checked the IRI library for the sub X models and mm, that uh, these two models as the uh, only one I can download. I don't know why I made some um, technical problem. I, when I download another third, uh, the third model, so that will be the tool I have. Okay. Yeah. Um, and so, do you have any thoughts on why your why the um, Ezra Sim model seems to be higher skill? I was just curious what that why that model might be higher skilled. Oh yeah, you mean the why, the reason why some model have, has higher skill than other two models. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, that, yeah, that should be, be a good question. I, um, because the um, research is halfway done, so I will continue working on that problem and uh, find out the reason why this model has some priority. It's very significant compared with other two. Okay, thank you. Steve has a question, go ahead, Steve. Yeah, I'm curious if this skill is coming from low frequency variability, long-term trends or interannual variability. Have you looked at that? Oh yeah, that, that is a very good question. Um, we want to study the, the predictable skill um, and see if it comes from the interannual variability, the signal variability. So to calculate this, uh, this will be the I arrange all the data together, so it should be the annual annual data we use here. I only remove the climatology. Maybe I should I should remove uh I should detrain the data side for each season and see if the predictability is from the seasonality or something else. Yeah, that would be very good. I will do that next. Thank you very much. All right. Any other questions? All right, thank you very much. We'll move on to our next speaker. Um, talk is, in is titled State Dependent Predictability of S2S -S Forecast Using the Python Package Climpred. And our speaker is Judith Berner. Go ahead, Judith. Hi. Okay, well, thank you so much for the opportunity to speak here. Very interesting session. Um, so this is work um, that has been done by uh, myself and Abby J at NCAR, um, but I would like to acknowledge um, the uh, Aaron Spring, Antje Weisheiner, Christian Strom, and, and certainly Yaga for um, the S2S runs. So, um, so um, Yaga um, produced these S2S runs as an extension um, <clears throat> to the uh, SUPEX product, uh, project that was um, led by um, Kathy. And so um, here we look at uh, spread and error between different models. And we see that overall the models are under dispersive. And so um, we also noted that um, when we looked at sort of the ordering, um, sometimes we got different orders uh, between uh, RMS error and forecast skill. 
And so I tried to dive a little further into this. Um, since we had these simulations, there was really a need for a verification package um, uh, for the um, sort of an in-house verification that package to look at um, initialized forecasts on the S2S timescales. And so we developed this with money from NOAA, which I would like to um, acknowledge. And um, basically um, we have a, a number of notebooks uh, developed by Abby J, which um, start a DAS cluster. Um, they um, remove the lead time dependent bias. They uh, remove the climatology and then um, uh, uh, produce a number of deterministics and probabilistic skill scores, um, leveraging the package X skill score. <clears throat> and the forecast alignment is done uh, with the Python package Climbred that is right now maintained and developed by Aaron Spring um, at the University of Hamburg. And so um, these have been uh, developed and used by the ASB Summer Colloquium last year. And we are happy to um, share those with anyone who's interested. And the idea was to uh, get rid of all of this tedious pre-processing that we have to do if you look at S2S forecasts, uh, in particular, uh, removing the lead time dependent bias. And now we're starting to do some science with it. So everything I show here is very preliminary. Um, so uh, what we want to look at is potential and actual predictability, then the state dependence of forecast skill on large scale patterns. Uh, we want to look at the uh, uh, influence of bias on forecasts uh, and uh, because we normally these verifications are done on anomalies and um, and we remove the lead time dependent forecast bias, which is a form of model error. And then when we looked into this, the signal to noise paradox uh, popped up on the S2S timescale. So here I'm looking at three models. It's the ECMWF, uh, it's CSM2, and it's uh, NCEP. Uh, the former two have two, 11 ensemble members and NCEP only four. So here we're looking at the error. So the first column is forecast for uh, weeks one, two, the middle one weeks three, four, and the right one weeks um, five, six. Um, for ECMWF in the top row, CSM2, and then NCEP just as comparison. <clears throat> and since we had some NOAA funding, we thought we should include it in the comparison. And uh, here are some perfect model results. So here we're not verifying or computing the error in regard to um, um, with the verification, but we choose one ensemble member uh, as verification. So we're going to look at the, in, to which degree the inherent predictability in these models are different or the same. Um, in the perfect model scenario, spread and error have to be the same, and uh, I give you the formula, and it turns out that um, they are only the same if the RMS error is computed exactly the same way as the spread, and that means that the sum of all ensemble members has to be taken. So you take the ensemble member, you remove the mean, you take the square, but you have to do this for each ensemble member, otherwise you don't get the identity in the perfect model scenario. <coughs> And moreover, I should say here, this ensemble mean that's removed has to be also taken over all ensemble members, including the member we use at verification. This just comes straight out of um, sort of an analytical derivation. Um, so what is the difference between uh, the spread and error? So here I'm just removing the spread of ESMWF uh, or the error of ESMWF for each uh, forecast lead time. And so we find here that CSM has more spread than ESMWF for uh, the week uh, one, two forecast. This has probably to do with um, how we initialize the model, which is sort of the an anomaly initialization as opposed to using data simulation. But then in the uh, later forecast lead times, we have sort of a mix with regions that are over and under dispersive, but overall it's sort of similar. Uh, whereas uh, NCEP actually has uh, less spread on all lead times. And this is probably because it less ensemble members. So here's the ACC. Oh yeah, and so I should also say, uh, no, i say it later. So um, here, um, uh, now we look here at uh, the anomaly skill and um, we see that uh, the skill is highest, again, in the perfect model scenario is highest in the tropics, in the tropical belt. And interestingly, we see that CSM has more skill than ECMWF in the perfect model uh, context for weeks three, four and longer. So this is CSM we see here over the whole Northern hemisphere is sort of uh, darker colors. And then also, especially in this tropical belt and we could 
hypothesized that has to do with a better representation of ENSO. Uh, we also saw that when we looked at the era, um, it was largest over the Northern hemispheric uh, regions. Whereas here, if you look at skill, um, uh, really what pops out is the tropics. And so the large error over the North hemispheric land really is an expression of the large amplitude of the anomalies, but not, not necessarily predictive skill. And that was one of the questions we had um, the, uh, in the summary paper that Yaga led. Um, so if we, here now we actually look at the actual hindcast, so we are verifying against the observations. And now we see that ECMWF has better forecast skill than CSM uh, for weeks uh, three, four and longer. So what's going on? Um, here I'm uh, looking actually at the uh, um, difference between the actual ACC and the perfect ACC. And if we take the ratio, it's the RCP that's typically taken um, for the signal to noise paradox in the signal to noise paradox community. But here I'm showing the difference because if you divide by zero, you get ugly plots. So here's the difference. So wherever it is zero, the actual predictability reaches the predictability limit as estimated in the perfect model. Um, and uh, wherever uh, it is uh, positive, the actual predictability is actually higher than that estimated by the perfect model. And so wherever it is here red uh, for weeks three, four and, and five, six, the actual predictability is actually higher than that um, uh, uh, in the perfect model at for ECMF and also for NCEP. But again, NCEP was under dispersive probably. So uh, interestingly, we don't see this paradox <clears throat> for CSM. And so uh, it's a good question what's going on. Is the intrinsic predictability of CSM actually higher than that for the ECMWF model? And obviously, uh, this is linked to the spread. You would think that if you have an ensemble system and you have diverging trajectories in another ensemble and they stay closer together, you would think that the predictability, uh, the sort of intrinsic predictability is higher for the model that is uh, less dispersive. And that obviously has um, uh, implications because we want to rerun all of those with stochastic parameterizations. And this is because the spread is too small, but we definitely don't want to introduce artifacts by becoming artificially over dispersive. So here again is these differences between the spread. And we see that overall the CSM spread is somewhat smaller, but there is regions where it's higher. And so uh, the fact that um, CSM is just under dispersive is not the only reason uh, that um, uh, contributes to the signal to noise paradox on the S to S time scale. It's typically reported for seasonal and larger time scales. Uh, also, the um, signal to noise community is, is typically looking at your potential height. I was been showing uh, two meter temperatures uh, uh, up until now, and uh, you you see you get the same message if you look at your potential heights. So, word of caution. Excuse me. <coughs> <coughs> so, uh, if we uh, compute uh, the ACC for the perfect model, the ensemble mean. Um, needs to be taken across all members, including the verifying member. If we don't do this, we can get here these regions of um, negative skill score. So in a perfect, which means that the ensemble mean is systematically anti-correlated to the verifying ensemble member, and that is physically not realistic. And so uh, we really need to uh, pay details to how the ACC is computed. Uh, for on these time scales, where skill is overall fairly small. This does not show up if your skill is really high. And so, if you do a bar plot <laughs> and you just take the average over it, you, you can get you can get wrong messages because it'll average over negative and positive skill, and the negative skill doesn't make sense. Uh, however, if we actually verify against actual data uh, observations, then uh, negative ACC is an expression of of model error and can happen. Uh, okay, so with this, I just want to show you some highlights uh, from the actual verification. So um, this one is the skill um, for these three models uh, for actually precipitation. And um, I was very pleased to see there's, there's a lot of noise, but there is really, um, and this is actual hindcast, not uh, potential ones, 
Um, so uh, really regionally, the precipitation is, can be captured up to six weeks. And I know uh, quite a bit of work has done over North America, but um, the strongest signal here if this global perspective is over the tropics and uh, for example, over Australia where CSM is able to capture precipitation better than ECMWF. Uh, next, we wanted to look at stain-dependent predictability, and, and Maria has nicely introduced this. Uh, it's been long known that these regime patterns, and which are indicative of um, persistent and recurrent pattern in the atmosphere, and uh, the Ferranti et al. paper has shown 2015 that those don't only pop up sort of in a seasonal investigation, but they, uh, if you stratify initialized forecasts by how they project onto, how the initial state projects under these large scale patterns. She shows here that the, uh, if you project uh, at initial time onto the negative NAO, you have extended predictability for Europe. So inspired by this, <clears throat> we introduced this um, state dependence predictability, <clears throat> for example, for the NAO, where if you have the negative NAO, uh, you have sort of here a more uh, blocked pattern and um, uh, it is more of a persistent pattern. And if we now look at all um, the forecasts that project at initial time on the negative NAO, we show this here on the right side, and if we look at the forecasts uh, for the neutral NAO, we show this on the left. Uh, the sample size on the right is much smaller than on the left, um, but we show here significance uh, uh, by using bootstrapping uh, with regard to uh, members um, in stippling. So, um, so here is shown the differences, and I apologize, now the CSM is in the bottom row and NSEP in the middle row. <clears throat> but we see, for example, that here in the Northeast, we have higher predictability um, for uh, negative NAO states than for neutral states. And uh, I can't see this because uh, this is also, um, sorry, uh, okay. Um, here is ENSO, <clears throat> so this is also shown if you average over the whole domain. Um, and here uh, is ENSO, uh, which obviously has, been investigated in terms of state dependent predictability. And uh, if you look here uh, for La Nina states, again, CSM is at the bottom. You have here a much higher predictability for uh, weeks three, four over ECMWF. So this is very nice. And this also shows up if you, if you take the average. This is again, actual predictability. Okay, so my summary is um, it's hard to develop good verification code. <laughs> we have, we have, uh, we, we really meant to do this as a community project. We're happy to share. But as soon as you go in, <clears throat> and it's nice to leverage other packages, but as soon as you <clears throat> want to do science, there's a lot of re good reason to develop everything from scratch. So you really know what you do, for example, with regard to how the ensemble mean is removed. Um, interestingly, um, the CSM does not exhibit the signal to noise paradox on the S to S time scale, but uh, the other models do. Um, uh, and ESMWF does, although has the same number of members. Details of the ACC computation matter um, in low skill scenarios, otherwise you get physically unrealistic results. And uh, we can uh, have also shown that uh, skill can be regionally larger during certain flow regimes. Um, uh, which is an extension of Ferranti et al. for the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, future work, well, we want to read one this suite with stochastic parameterizations, which is why it was important for me to look at the spread error. And down the line, when CIMA has fully incorporated MPAS into CSM, I'd be interested to um, rerun some of those simulations with MPAS and uh, maybe down the line with um, MPAS physics. Thank you. Thank you, Judith. Do we have questions? You can raise your hand or put those questions in the chat window. Um, not seeing any. Um, I have a question, and I may have just missed this, but um, so you talked about um, the signal to noise paradox, and you talked about the um, uh, stochastic parameterization. So, so basically addressing those issues of underspread. Um, but uh, I'm curious if you have a clear sense of whether the this is a the signal to noise. Um, paradox is occurring because of underspread or over signal? No, it's an excellent question. Yes, I don't know. And um, obviously, we want to introduce stochastic parameterization to get a 
better spread error ratio. Um, but we don't know what is the true spread in the true error. What has been shown is that in some cases, um, stochastic parameterizations can remove noise. And um, I've shown this um, for ENSO and understood it were how random perturbations can actually act as an additional damping. And so it is not clear yet whether the stochastic parameterizations might actually get, there is a potential they could get rid of the signal to noise paradox because it really has to do with the NAO index. Uh, and so there is a chance, and it is, it is known that the NAO index is influenced by including stochastic parameterizations. And certainly we don't know which of the models is right. Yeah. Yeah, I'm really curious about the S to S time scale for this because for the seasonal time scale, it appears um, the, the previous work I've seen with the NAO and the signal to noise paradox there, it seems to be that there's a, the models have way too strong of a signal is, is what they're attributing the, the source of that paradox to. Um, but I haven't seen a clear um, explanation of, of that for the S to S time scale. So I, I think there's a potential for, for very interesting results from that. So thanks, Judith. Thank you. All right, any other questions? All right, then I think we um, are um, done with our talk. So I'd like to say thank you to all of our speakers. Um, and I'd like to say, especially thank you. I really enjoy the opportunity to see all of the interesting things that people have done um, with uh, combining the initialized predictions um, um, from the Earth System Prediction Working Group and the subseasonal um, experiment and the S, you know, SS project um, with the many um, CESM simulations. And I really um, find it super exciting to see how bringing those, those things together can, can answer some really um, great questions about um, uh, predictability prediction um, across um, a, a wide range of time scales. So thank you all for, um, for um, showing that today. Um, I'm now going to pass things over to um, Steve and Yaga uh, for the co-chairs update. Thank you, Kathy. Yeah, and thank you everybody for participating and especially using the data sets that we've been producing. It's really nice to see that they're actually getting used in the community. So we're going to keep this update really short because for the majority of the hour, we actually want to hear from you and about the plans for the next two years about computer allocations and simulations and where would you like the working group to go. So after we go through just a handful of slides, I'll encourage you to put on your cameras if your internet connection allows and engage in the discussion so we can shape the working group for the entire community. All right, so in our update, primarily I'll summarize uh, with Steve some of the data sets that are available. So we may have new people online who are not aware of the breadth of the simulations that's already out there. Uh, so starting with CSM1, so I think all of the presentations, most of them presented today were already moved on to CSM2, especially uh, on the subseasonal time scale, but we have quite a uh, data set also left over from CSM1. So starting with the subseasonal to seasonal reforecasts, we have reforecasts for time period 1999 to 2015 that follow the same protocol, nearly the same protocol as uh, the ones with CSM2. They just ended 2015. Uh, and those are documented in Richter et al. 2020. And the data is in the RI, RI sub X library, just with the other sub X models. We also have seasonal forecasts with CSM1. Those were created by Julie Carone uh, and Joe Trivia, and those were contributing for a while to the NMME project. And those are also found with all the other NMME models in the IRI library. Uh, then I think then we have the Decadal Prediction Large Ensemble, uh, and that's a 40 member ensemble going back to 1954 uh, with November 1st starts, and that's been documented by Steve in the 2018 BAMS paper. And you heard a lot about the CSM2 reforecasts, and those are right now, we say here 2000 to 2020, those are just the reforecasts, but real-time forecasts have been running since, and they are available every week. So uh, we run the Monday's forecasts, usually on Tuesday or Wednesday. So usually you can find them on our site already by Thursday morning because that's when they're due to know us. So we just upload them to an FTP site. And uh, we also have instructions on the working group website how you can get them in real time. 
And those hold for the load trap model as well as for Wacom. So the real-time forecast with Wacom, we only run for the winter season, roughly for September through March. Um, and that's because it was really computationally too expensive to run the summer season as well. But if people would be interested in that, think about that, that's something we could put in into the subsequent allocation, for example. Uh, Steve, do you want to talk about the rest of these? Sure. So we've, we've heard already um, several talks using this, the new SMILE data set. Um, we made that available in winter. Um, you can go to the Earth System Prediction Working Group website and find out how to access those data. If you have an account on Cheyenne, we've um, recently just uploaded all that data to the Climate Data Gateway, and um, so it can be accessed from there as well. And the um, the documentation paper for that is um, available from Geoscientific Model Development. It is still uh, in revision, but that should be coming out um, within uh, a month or two. We've also then extended the SMILE November starts um, 10 members out to decadal time scales. And we've done this for the time periods um, from 1958 through 2019. So this is um, a proto CESM2 decadal prediction data set that we can consider um, expanding upon if, the, if that's a priority for the working group. Um, those will be coming soon. There, if you have, if you want early access, you can you can contact the co-chairs. Um, we haven't yet um, done any quality control on that, so you might want to hold off until we take a look at the CSM two DP results. And then finally, um, we've heard about the collection of CSM two S two S perturbed initialization experiments um, that um, Yaga is writing up. Right now, those will eventually become part of the working group um, assets. And I just want to mention that we do have a working group website now, but we don't have a liaison. So that website um, is not always up to date. So um, please have patience with us. So following on uh, what Steve said about the perturbation experiments with S2S, so Yanan also mentioned these. Uh, she's one of the people who's got early access, and we always welcome that for people to come and work with us and evaluate simulation early before we put them on the uh, climate data gateway. So typically, these simulations are in campaign storage, and if you're willing to help analyze the data, we welcome any collaborations. Uh, so that set right now includes the runs with climatological atmosphere, climatological ocean, and climatological atmosphere and climatological ocean together, and the land variability being the only uh, source of predictability coming in those simulations. So the point of these simulations has been to really uh, verify this accepted cartoon that Paul Deermeyer created, and I've been emailing with him back and forth, and he's coming actually to Boulder. So if you're in the Boulder area at the end of July, uh, you can come visit with him here too. Um, but just getting some of this history of the diagram because it's been repeated in many publications and reports and it's shown pretty much in every S2S talk. So um, he made this diagram to show where predictability may be coming from. And I think the piece of history that he says gets left out that it's meant to be representative of mid latitudes and of the land area. So looking actually where people are looking for predictions. So overland, and in latitudes is what he was intending the diagram to be. And some of the studies he's, he's done, so Dear Meyer et al, 2012, et cetera, have been focused on verifying this contribution from land that it peaks roughly at day seven and then decreases with time. And he's done some of these experiments with the NOAA model. So the set of experiments that we've been carrying out here is just meant to uh, expand on that and verify the contributions from the atmosphere and the ocean, and also look how that varies across different continents, different seasons, et cetera. So, so far the figure on the right is what we have inferred from these experiments so far. And surprisingly, it's showing us little predictability from the ocean in our model. It's growing as you get to weeks five, six, but in this subseasonal window that we typically look at in weeks three, four, it's really land in the atmosphere, at least in CSM2, that seem to be providing the majority of the predictability. 
We're working on a Klimo land uh, experiment, and that one has been challenged to set up. So we've been working with Sanjeev Kumar how to best do that, because unlike the atmospheric initial conditions that are really easy to make a climatology out of because of the different uh, uh, configurations of the variables in the land model, we can't just do that. So we've tried an experimental suite where we spun up the land model with uh, climatological atmospheric conditions and we're trying that now, but I'm not sure if that's really worked. So Sanjeev is gonna put up some other suggestions during the discussion for how we can perhaps do that better. And if anybody else is interested in analysis, just uh, go ahead and email me. Okay, and then Steve, do you wanna do this one? Yeah, so, um, so Judith's talk was a nice, um, introduction to the challenges associated with analyzing initialized prediction data sets. They're very large. Um, um, there's, there's huge amounts of, of data to ingest. And so we've been putting effort into developing shared Python tools for efficient interactive analysis of these data sets. And I mentioned on Monday that we've uh, put together this package called ESP Lab that will be rolled out with the SMILE overview paper. So the time frame for that is order months. And this um, includes tools for data ingestion and skill verification for data sets on Glade like SMILE and DPLE. And this package um, leverages X-Ray, DASK and, and Jupyter to, to facilitate that data analysis. Um, and I have one example on the next slide. So, what we found um, putting together this set of tools um, specifically for uh, analyzing the SMILE data set is that the real obstacle is um, ingesting the data and getting it into a nice format for analyzing. And so one of the key functionalities that this package will um, allow you to do is to get data directly from Glade um, without any pre-processing and um, structure that into uh, a DASC array like the one you see on the upper right here um, that has the dimensions that you, that you want for analyzing hindcast data. For, so for example, this is a, a precipitation um, DASC array that is dimensioned lat lawn, and then it has additional dimensions for uh, initialization year um, lead time and ensemble size. So here M is 40. This is a DPLE um, DASC array. And this was put together um, by um, using some functions that Daniel Kennedy had created for looking at um, uninitialized large ensembles. And with help from Liz Maroon and Tegan King, um, we got this into a, a documented function that um, really uh, I have found in my my work um, greatly speeds up analysis of, of these large data sets. So we've um, created a CSM ESPWG GitHub organization. That's where the ESP lab sits today. You can, you can already go there and, and use it, although um, you know, use it with caution because we're, it, we're still changing it. And you can contact me or, or Tegan uh, if you'd like to get involved. Um, we'd love to have contributors uh, kind of expanding our, our toolkits for uh, hindcast analysis. All right, so the next is discussion. Perhaps before we move on to that, I see some things in the chat. Are there any questions about what was presented here? I don't know, Kathy, do you see the chat? I do not see any um, questions in the chat. Um, oh wait, yeah, there is one talking about the uh, predictability figure um, from David Lawrence asking, what field does that figure represent? And is the CSM one global as the title implies? And have you tried to focus on land mid-latitudes as Paul's figure is meant to represent? Uh, yes, yeah, so it's supposed to look at surface temperature. And yes, we have this diagram for different um, continents and we could do it off the different regions. And there are some differences, but it looks mainly the same over majority of regions. South Africa is a little bit different. Um, 
there is a little bit more predictability there from land. But yes, so we, we definitely looking over different regions and for surface temperature mainly. And just follow up, it just, I'm sure that you're thinking about it, but the ocean having such small influence just seems really unintuitive. It is. And, the, you know, and we ran an entire suite by accident when we had a, a software engineering error that we had ocean from there was different by one year. <laughs> and then we could not tell apart the new runs from the old runs. So we kind of verified that result a second way, which we didn't put in this uh, paper yet. But it, it was really surprising to us that we could have an ocean that was a year old and our skill did not change very much. And that's looking over the entire hindcast period. So perhaps, you know, during El Nino year and so years that might be different, but overall over the entire hindcast period, that's what it seems to be, which is, has been surprising. Maria, you had a comment or question. Uh, you had your hand raised and then there's also something in the chat window. Do you want to just speak up and, and say what you, yeah, sorry. Uh, it's lunch here. So I, I wanted to put it in the chat, but I want to make sure I got it in before. So it's in the chat. Okay. Um, yeah, so Maria's question is, um, could the way the climatology for the ocean is being computed also be affecting the lower predictability contribution coming from the ocean? Did you use JRA or CSM? Uh, so we used, we made climatology out of the JRA files. But um, yeah, as I said before, we've done this, uh, the experiment where the ocean is a year old and it also did not change our skill very much. So this is where it's brought up the questions, how much predictability there is on these shorter time scales. And we thought that perhaps we just need the hindcast to be run longer, but unfortunately we do not save the restart. So ideally we would find out we know that the ocean is going to play a greater role when we go to the seasonal time scales. But at this time with the experiments we have, we can't quite say when exactly that starts, but it's probably somewhere between six and 10 weeks, I would guess. Would it make sense to do that for the like multi-year or decadal, even though it is a, a different forecasting setup, et cetera? Yeah, so that's one of the things we can think about uh, for our last discussion item is do we do carry some of these experiments out on the longer time scale and also with the ocean and also with climatological land potentially. I think that's one of the suggestions we'll get to in the Google Doc. All right, well, I think we're ready to go into the discussion section. So we have these three main topics that I have here. Uh, and Kathy, do you want to introduce the first topic? Yeah, sure. So we've been uh, contacted by the um, UFS community, which UFS is the Unified Forecast System. It's the new NOAA um, model. Um, and in particular, focused around S to S um, for what they contacted us about. Um, and they, um, they contacted us to see if there's interest in, um, in collaborating um, and interacting with, um, with them in terms of um, S to S or system prediction. Um, and I think um, it's worth having a discussion about that because um, uh, I'm just thinking that, you know, one of the benefits of doing these initialized predictions and our system prediction work is um, ultimately, it tells us about our models, so we can learn something about um, about um, ways to improve our models, you know, errors that, that occur in our models, and 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 ultimately, hopefully, lead to model improvement. And so, I think um, there might be some value in um, there in having some UFS experiments that are parallel to some of our um, our system prediction working group experiments with CESM um, that would allow us to do some similar analyses. Um, between um, the two models to, to um, that I think would ultimately help in, in model improvements um, for both modeling systems. Um, so um, I guess the question I was sort of thinking to, to, to launch to the, to the community is, is if, there would, if there were parallel experiments with UFS that were consistent with the, um, the S to S experiments from the Earth System Prediction Working Group, um, would there be interest in, in doing, doing similar analyses across both the UFS and 
um, the CESM models. We have Gokhan and Judith. So Gokhan, go ahead. Yeah, just to uh, clarify that, I, so no new experiments are needed to be run from the CESM side. They are just going to repeat it from their side and there will be common analysis. Is that the proposal? Um, so yeah, that's what I'm proposing is the idea that we're, we're certainly not asking that, the, you know, expecting the ESPWG to do any of the UFS um, um, experiments. But I'm saying there's a potential for, for experiments from UFS that could be done in a, in a parallel context to what's been done with CSM. So then we have two different models, but with similar experiments that we could do analysis across. Those experiments don't exist yet, but I think there's potential for them to exist um, and contribute to the broad scope of, of Earth system prediction um, types of experiments um, available to the community. Okay, thank you. Judith? Yeah, I mean, I think one other thing is that um, to get the results we have, we have to remove the lead time dependent bias. And I haven't shown this, but if you leave it in, the skill is much, much lower or negligible. And so my understanding is that the UFS runs, we, we can ask for certain dates and stuff, but they, they clearly are nowhere near having 20 years of um, hindcasts. And so um, I, I think it would be great to engage the community. It's a pot, uh, potential funding source. Um, it really helps to um, compare, you know, um, to the next generation <laughs> NWP models uh, in this context. But I think the emphasis would need to be on case studies as opposed to anything we do, which involves removing a lead time dependent bias averaged over 20 years. Yeah, so I, I mean, I realize that those experiments, the, the a large ensemble, our large Heincast ensemble set of experiments with UFS does not exist yet um, for the, you know, consistent with, with what, what we have with CSN. Um, but I think there, you know, there is potential for that to exist. Those, those will exist eventually. Um, and there's interest, I think, amongst the, the UFS community um, and, you know, bringing in the community to work with UFS um, to do some of those kinds of experiments. Um, I myself am interested in that. So I um, would certainly uh, think about if I were to do experiments with UFS, I would, I would make them parallel to, you know, to the ESP ex um, working group experiments. So then they would be useful more broadly to the community and address that issue of the, of the lead dependent climatology. Yeah, and just as a comment, we're doing this for certain case studies um, with regard to stochastic parameterizations. Does anybody else have any comments or any other comments on engaging with UFS and NOAA? Kathy, maybe can you give us a quick SubEx update as well? Yeah, sure. So SubEx continues with the um, real-time um, experiments, uh, real-time forecast every week. Um, that data is posted on um, the IRI data server. Um, and um, as new models come online, they do, um, the modeling groups provide us the new versions of their models um, and those hindcasts get posted um, as well. So those data sets continue to be um, provided. Um, we've doing some new things with, um, with the graphics for the forecast. Um, and there's definitely individual PI research going on with the, with the SubX data. Um, I myself have planned to incorporate the real-time CESM um, forecast um, into the, the public, uh, my, the webpage that I have that publicly puts the forecast um, images up um, so people could see how the real-time CSM um, you know, data um, and forecast and, and how that compares with other models and if they wanted to you know, use, use those real-time forecasts for anything. Um, then um, that would help to see um, CS, where CSM fits in with the other models and contributes to multi-model ensemble. That's great. Thanks, Kathy. Uh, Sanjeev? Yeah, uh, regarding uh, your last point, uh, collaborating with the UFS, uh, where will be the data available? Like, because these reforecast data are the big data, so we do not want to download and store it on, on our own computers. Whether the data would be available through the NCAR system that would help us to kind of do the parallel analysis or is there some thought of 
yeah, making that data infrastructure also streamlined. Um, I think that's something that we will need to communicate to the UFS community that for us to engage with them, um, that the, 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 the data sets need to be easily accessible and easy for, for, um, for us to, to use in combination with the other data sets we're using. Um, at this point, this is a preliminary discussion about um, whether this community is interested in collaborating, um, interacting with, with the UFS community. Um, and so this is the opportunity to provide our uh, feedback on what is needed in, in order to facilitate those collaborations. So we will make sure to um, to share that um, issue of the of the data access um, uh, as a as a critical component. Thank you, Judith. Judith? Yeah, in this context, um, we looked um, into putting the S two S data onto the cloud um, for both the CSM S two S and also the SubEx S two S. And we're working with the data library, Aaron Kaplan at IRI. Um, and so, um, especially with these sort of, uh, as Steve said, uh, if you use X-Array and Dask, which we are using and, and Steve is using, um, it is sort of trivial to access data in the cloud. And the trick is to have them in the right format. <clears throat> and so I think uh, it would be really nice for the community to put all the S2S data into the cloud. I think Noah is ahead of us in this in this regard, uh, uh, but maybe they're not using the, the best formats. You really want to have a big czar store, and so I think there's a uh, obviously a uh, I'm not sure if it's a software engineering project how to do this best. But I, I think the, it would be really nice to have all the data into the cloud, and if you don't have it locally, it goes directly into the cloud and, and you know, maybe down the line, we will have cloud computations. I think this would be great for us. It would be great for uh, the community together with these um, pre-processing tools that are paralyzed using Dask uh, that, that we can send out to really facilitate that people do the science they want to do. And this would be really for universities, but even, you know, sort of developing countries where uh, once they, also have cloud computing, they can do really relevant research without having HPC. So, so I think there's a really big opportunity here down the line to really make this research available across the globe. Okay. Yeah, coming back to the potential benefits of this effort to CESM, there are other S2S systems out there and they are, I mean, as close as possible or as different as possible from ours. What would be the specific benefit that we would get? I mean, you indicated that it is model improvements, but it's so general and we can probably tackle that thing with existing system comparisons as well. Yeah, I just see potential. Um, I don't think that there's a clear and specific, um, you know, at this point, I think it's just an idea of how, how potentially their community is interested in collaborating with us. We're interested, we may be interested in collaborating with them. Um, but, you know, this is, like I said, a preliminary discussion about whether there would even be interest in furthering this conversation about, um, you know, collaborating. Um, so I don't think I have a direct answer for, for that particular, um, you know, question at this point. But I, I find value in, um, in working with different models and understanding how different model biases um, have affect predictability prediction question, you know, answers of, of um, questions about predictability and prediction. When you have a, a, a these case studies where some model seems to, to to get something really right and some model seems to get something really wrong, and or or many models are getting it all wrong. You know, all the models are getting it wrong. I think there's value in in seeing that and then using that as a, a way of trying to understand, um, you know, why are some models getting this and some not, or why why did everybody get it wrong? Um, and so um, from a, in a broad sense, I find working with many models actually very, very useful for, for answering these kinds of predictability and prediction questions. Is somebody attending from this group, they are having a workshop, I think, in a few weeks, right? UFS workshop, and I think they'll cover these aspects as well. Yeah, the registration ends in two days. So if you're interested, maybe uh, I'll try to look it up and post it in the chat, the link, but uh, it ends in two days, the registration. I guess I plan to attend some of the sessions remotely um i think it's an online and in-person workshop at least as of now so 
And I'm trying to see if there's anyone from NOAA on the, uh, who might be related to it, involved in UFS on, on our call. I see, Deepti, are you, um, is somebody who can speak to, to this? Um, Hi, Kathy, uh, this is Deepti. Yeah, I can, I can find out the link for the UFS workshop. I think um, uh, I'm not directly involved in that, but uh, I'm uh, definitely aware of the workshop going on. So, and about the data sets, yes, I think I was actually trying to look up the, uh, some of the S2S data sets that we have available for the prototype runs that are already on the cloud. But um, I'm not particularly uh, sure about the format and things like that, but I think like what Ju Judith was saying, I think the format of the data set may not be the most user-friendly. So we are really interested in learning more about what kind of format would be more, you know, more modern and more, um, 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 more um, I mean, um, technically you know, more easily accessible so we can learn about that and I can pass that information to um, others who are you know, uploading the data. So we do have a couple of prototypes, I think, two or three prototypes that are the most recent ones on the cloud. I can find out the link and post it in the chat. All right, thank you, DT. Um, so yeah, I just, wanna, I just wanna acknowledge this broad scope of, of data accessibility um, issues. Uh, I think that's one of the things that the Earth System Prediction Working Group is doing an excellent job of providing by providing all these data sets um, at, and, and NCAR as a whole does, as an institution does an excellent job of this. Um, this, from the S, per, S to S perspective, this issue of data access for very large data sets is an ongoing problem for the whole community. Um, and so I think um, while we as a group can help to provide insights on how to address it, I think this is a much broader than just um, the ESP working group um, community um, issue. And I, I myself will continue to, to work with program managers to push on this as, a, as an important aspect of of um, you know issues with with working with initialized prediction experiments. All right, and I posted the link to the UFS workshop in the chat. And Sanjeev, you have a hand up. Yeah, uh, I I just had one comment to supporting what Kathy said. Uh, one of the be potential benefits that I see it may increase the user base or the CSM model would be more known to the to the operational community and that may likely to give you a better feedback or more critical area for the improvement. That is a kind of potential benefit that I see. I don't know if you have tested it, whether it is a potential benefit or not. Thank you. All right, how about we move on to the next topic of discussion? Steve, do you want to introduce that? Yeah, sure. Um, do you want to share the slide again? Yeah. Um, yeah, so this is a, a topic of discussion that, that leads into the, the question of what, what simulations to propose for the next round of CSL allocation. Um, and, and that's this, uh, largely unanswered question of what, what is the minimum set of runs that we need to, to do sensitivity studies to test for skill improvements. And of course, um, you can envision that the answer to this will, will change with time scale and with field of interest, but um, we really don't have a good sense of, um, uh, you know, of, of What's a minimal what's a minimal experiment to perform that we can compare to what are now our foundational data sets, DPLE, SMILE, S2S, uh, if we want to um, start to explore um, ways to improve skill for CESM forecasts. So uh, I guess we're, in a sense, looking for, for people interested in, in this question and um, volunteers to either um, push push something forward or work with us to to get answers to this question. And just to put it in a little bit more context, we'll have a fixed amount of computing resources that we'll need to decide in the next item what to do with. Uh, and we're in the process of developing CSM3, so there will be different versions of the model. So the more if we answer this question and it allows us to better plan, how can we help out with the model development process and see, for example, if MJO ends the predictability changes, 
with the physics uh, changes in the model. So the smaller, if we use a smaller number of years, then we can test more configurations. If a larger number of years is needed or the entire Heincast suite, then we can only probably do this once or maybe twice during the development process and maybe for one of the time scales. So although it seems like a, maybe not the most exciting science question is actually crucial to integrating with the CSM development process and uh, helping them along the way too. So the main question would be, does anybody from the community, would they want to do this kind of work or help out with it? I think you may be getting silence because it's a very hard question. <laughs> the good news is we have the data sets that we can start subsampling, right? So we have the basic states. Um, and I guess the question would be how many years of either the S2S or SMILE or S2D runs do we need to actually get to a basic skill score that we trust? That's how you know we were thinking maybe of starting. And then if you subsample a different set of years, if it completely changes the answer, um, it's perhaps not viable. Good, go Khan. Well, just to start the discussion, I guess, since everybody is silent. But, I mean, one thing, I mean, uh, related to that question is how does the like the model bias impact the prediction skill, right? That can be within that category as well. But uh, I mean, uh, so based on uh, Steve's sort of uh, recent, uh, well, I guess he's working on his, his recent uh, results, it looks like actually the number of ensemble members that one needs or minimum will depend upon what you're after, I guess, and it will depend on the fields and all that stuff. But if, the per if we rephrase the question, uh, and uh, ask the following question rather, uh, so maybe I should just back up a little bit. What Steve's results are showing is that additional, you, you, you need a minimal ensemble set and it may be really a handful of ensembles, maybe five, but anything that you add on top of it is literally beating down the noise. It's not adding any new spatial areas of skill. It is not adding necessarily or taking away any uh, skill from existing areas. So if the goal is to get a preliminary assessment of impacts of certain changes, maybe some artificial model bias improvement or some parametrization, I think, I mean, based again, uh, Steve's results, we may need only a few ensemble members, maybe five. And that can give us a preliminary indication of whether we are actually uh, doing better with respect to, to maybe additional skill areas. And perhaps we can get a quick sense of whether we are increasing the skill with minimal ensemble set. So maybe, I mean, that might be a way to pursue that with minimal ensembles, maybe five, and then uh, looking into many aspects or many different physics or bias correction techniques rather than trying to beat the ensemble spread and then get more signal out of it. As a, I mean, I'm not saying we shouldn't do that, but it's as the first step. Well, I, I think you're maybe exaggerating a bit the results that I've shown. Um, it seems like maybe the overall pattern of where there's positive and negative skill is fairly insensitive to ensemble size once you have a minimal set, but the actual skill scores themselves are quite sensitive. Um, and, and if that's ultimately your goal is to um, be able to do experiments that with some confidence establish that you have enhanced the skill of the system, I don't think we're talking about the, the pattern of skill. I think we're, we are in fact talking about the skill scores themselves. And, and obviously, we've got the experiments in hand to explore these issues like DPLE, you know, we, we have saturated the skill for, for oceanic variables with 40 members. And so we can certainly um, get a quantification of, you know, what's a minimal set, what's a minimal verification window, you know, for looking at 
say SST scale, which is, would be a key metric for decadal scale predictions. But if we want to look at, at things in the atmosphere, you know, 40 members isn't, isn't enough, even with DPLE. So are you thinking the, of uh, like a, um, uh, you're thinking that that if pe there's people who will be willing to volunteer to do um, a bunch of evaluation of skill um, for some common types of metrics um, for a different number, for sort of see the sensitivity of the number of ensemble members and the sensitivity of the number of, of which years are used. Um, is that what you're thinking? Yeah. Steve Yaga, I think what, what what I think this working group needs is a um, a set of metrics that are key for prediction on different time scales. So if maybe for S two S, you're most interested in MJO. <clears throat> What's the minimal uh, um, number of hindcasts that are needed, minimal ensemble size to to get some sense of MJO skill? Um, I feel like to to make progress, we, we need some answers to those questions so that we don't have to replicate the full set every time we're testing model changes or initialization changes. But yes, in short, Kathy, we're looking for volunteers who would be willing to come up with those metrics for the different timescales and not necessarily the same person for all the timescales and help sorting the issue. How many years of S2S would we need to rerun if, for example, now uh, CSM3 is going to a higher vertical resolution grid, so there is extra levels in the boundary layer that will likely change the uh, ocean atmosphere coupling, so likely they will change the MJO. And how many years do we need to rerun before we tell the atmospheric model working group, gosh, <laughs> we don't really don't like this model configuration, oh wow. Uh, the MJO skill is just as good or even better, right? Like we don't want to find this out in three years when CSM3 is frozen and we have a new ocean model, new grid, new physics, everything's been put together, but then there will be no understanding if the skill has changed, uh, where that change of skill has come from. So maybe right. there's maybe people are you know of course hesitant to volunteer um, just sitting here on Zoom, um, but um, from the S to S perspective, I will volunteer to coordinate volunteers. Um, <laughs> so if if um, from the S to S time scale, if if people are interested in um, in maybe getting having a little side conversation or group to discuss how we might go about doing this, um, please contact me and, and I'm happy to organize that. Yeah, and for all the other time scales, if you email Steve and I and Kathy, maybe the three of us together, that would be great. All right, well, let's move on then to the last discussion topic. It's not unrelated. Uh, and it's the proposed simulations for the next CSL proposal. Uh, Gokhan, when is that due to you? Well, I, I'm waiting for a response from Dave Hart. I'm guessing that uh, I will need them probably early uh, August at the latest. Okay, so that's about six weeks out and then the allocation starts in November of 2022 and it goes for two years. So it's really important to get everybody's input on what we will do. And Gokhan, do you have a rough number of uh, hours for us? Well, so, I mean, it's, I don't know when the new machine is coming. So we have to go with the, I think two, uh, 230 million hours that we have right now. I would go with the existing allocation at the moment. I will try to send them as soon as possible as I hear more from Dave. Okay. So I put up on the screen here, this Google doc, which I sent out by email. Uh, let's see, Kathy, can you put the link in the chat? Uh, so it was sent out by email to the working group yesterday and people have been populating it with ideas. So I thought perhaps we put up some of the ideas and see if there is any other input. And I started categorizing them by time scale. Um, so for the shorter time scales and also for the seasonal to interannual, I think it would be really useful to do some testing with the new ocean model MOM6 and also the new atmosphere vertical grid. 
So their configuration of CSM2, I think that X, that's what Julio is calling it, will be ready shortly. So for sure it will be ready by the time the new allocation comes. So in the spirit again of testing scale changes so we don't have surprises with CSM3, I thought that would be uh, you know, a good set of experiments even if we would run DJF or a subset of those states. Uh, and the next suggestion is by Sanjeev. So Sanjeev, do you wanna describe that? Yes. Uh, so we were, uh, yeah, I was working with Yaga for some of that land um, climatological initialization and it looked like, yeah, generating those files. Um, yeah, we, we have some issues. So I thought about how about doing the all but one uh, climatological initialization. In that case, we are taking the initial condition from a different year. Like for example, if we are running it for 2014, I'll take the initial condition for all other year except for 2015. And we have tested this methodology a couple of different times and we find that all but one initialization gives you a sufficiently different initial condition that is significantly different initial condition, at least with respect to the land state. So I thought maybe if, if community is interested uh, we, for the sensitivity or the climatological study, we can uh, uh, yeah, test this methodology in the CSM suits. I think that would be a good one to add to the list of the experiments we've been doing. Mm -hmm. uh, Judith, did you have a hand up? Yeah, yeah, I did, but it, it, I'm not sure if it's helpful. Um, I, I understand you're asking, you know, which simulation should we do? But I think from a scientific perspective, there's sort of two outstanding questions. I think one is, what are the causes for coupled model drift? I think it's a huge one and I, I don't think, I can't think of a simulation that we can do that addresses this, but I think this is really something where we can really improve the modeling efforts to understand this better. Um, and uh, the second one is, um, you know, on the, for the S2S time, time scale specifically, does data, SLA, data simulation help you <clears throat> for forecasting? I, I, I am impressed how well CSM is doing with the anomaly initialization you put into there. And I think an outstanding sign question is sort of, um, if you have a real DA system, ideally coupled weakly or strongly, you know, how much predictive skill do you gain? Um, Dan, are you on the line to comment about some of the experiments you still hope to do this year? Yeah, absolutely. And right, Judith, I think those are yeah, important questions and also um, related ones. Um, so in the shoot this year, we've been looking at um, uh, ocean DA forced by an ensemble reanalysis in CAM6, um, and particularly looking for strategies to increase spread among the ocean states, um, which has classically been like one of the underlying problems with doing ocean DA. And so, for instance, um, using um, a hybrid um, DA formulation to try and bring in more spread within the deep ocean, which I think has been one of the underlying issues there. But I, I think moving forward, there is, um, I think, yeah, a strategic choice to make on the DA side. I can talk about that now, or I, I don't want to <laughs> derail this conversation. I think go for it. Yeah, I mean, and so I, we had recently um, a WCRP workshop on data simulation for climate. And Yaga actually posed an interesting question there in her talk, um, which was, you know, what approaches can we use to move away from having to compute um, climatologies to do um, anomaly uh, predictability studies? And this actually kind of gets at the crux of what we can do in DA because it determines whether we need to be in the business of producing long reanalyses um, in order to really study um, the impact of DA initialized um, predictability. So I, I, you know, I think that trying to think about lightweight um, ways to do DA to you know longer term reanalyses is one way forward. An alternative would be to think about DA approaches to estimate model bias, and these are things you know used, for instance, by the forecasting centers um, to uh, you know estimate model bias online in, in DA 
contexts. So um, yeah, those are kind of maybe complementary approaches. So along those lines, do we have suggestions for specific experiments? I mean, you know, to, to yeah, start that, you know, in terms of a long-term reanalysis, um, I think a way to do it would be to leverage the existing atmospheric reanalysis um, to couple it to an ocean ENOI. And then we can think about um, different strengths of coupling between the ocean and atmosphere components. Um, so this is kind of getting at this weakly versus couply strong, or strongly coupled problem. Um, and then on the bias adjustments side, you know, there, yeah, these approaches used at ECMWF developed a long time ago. Um, they do not currently exist in DART, but we could push for that if that's of interest. Okay. Yeah, I Does anybody else have any comments on the DA topic and kind of how to move that forward within the CSM framework? So just one follow-up question, Dan, out of the workshop, did uh, were the specific uh, common experiments or were there any outcomes of that workshop that would help to guide kind of how to do answer these questions? One takeaway I had was just looking at some of the distinctions between DA used for numerical weather prediction and DA as it applies to climate models. Um, I think one of them was just that the forecast time scales are much longer and that the model biases on those time scales are also much graver. And so, you know, an emergent focus of some of the work, which is something I think we can do more here is, yeah, just to bring in the observations in a DA framework to think about objective procedures for bias correction. So if I could interject, I think uh, one thing that's important to communicate here is that um, the working group has resources and resources that are available to the community. And that's really what we're soliciting here. And we're not soliciting your ideas. Um, if you wanna keep them private, um, you can contact us uh, co-chairs privately, but we would like to um, have people know that um, we can provide the compute resources needed to realize your ideas. The only ask is that there's some eventual um, you know, tie into the working group or benefit to the working group. So if you're hesitant to speak up, um, that's understandable, but you can contact us later if you have an idea that requires compute resources from this working group. Kathy? Yeah, um, on the, the topic of this, this issue of quantifying, you know, model biases and how much do we need in order to do that and bringing in data simulation, one of the things I, I've seen from the S to S time scale and certainly also um, seen from other people, even on the weather time scale, is while the biases are much larger as you go further out in time, their actual spatial structure and the, the biases, th those start very quickly. Like within the first week, you can start to see the temperature and SST, uh, temperature and uh, um, some of the SST biases, some of the precip biases, they're all, they all start very early. So it makes me wonder if we can't uh, sort of, how, I don't know how to do this, but I've, I've had this thought that maybe of, of using shorter time scale, um, you know, predictions to then help to then maybe and then maybe somehow adapt those to to the model to estimating the model biases for longer time scale. Um, I don't really know how to do that. It's just sort of a, I don't know, half baked, quarter baked idea in my head um, that um, might maybe somebody has a, a good way of, of dealing with that. Jerry. Uh, yeah, we're actually uh, starting to look at that. Um, and we're, the idea is that it, maybe you could use the large ensemble simulations, which by definition are already drifted. Um, you can use those as your reference climo to calculate anomalies as opposed to a drifted uh, climatology, which is kind of the conventional way of, of calculating the anomalies. Um, but uh, looking at these uh, results right now, as you can imagine, um, when you look at the drifted climatologies, the drifts are all pretty similar, the patterns, 
but when you look at the drifts in the actual initialized hindcasts, um, it takes about five years to get to the magnitude of the anomalies that you see in the drifted, uh, the, the large ensemble. So I think you could use uh, the large ensemble as a drifted climatology if you're looking at the longer lead times, like say years four to seven or four to eight or something like that. But I think if you're using, if you're looking at shorter time scales, less than five years or so, um, that's that's probably not not a, a, an obvious workaround, but I think it is promising for the longer time scales. So that'd save you having to run an entire hindcast set um, to get what the drifted climo, climo is. Uh, and you could just use the, the large ensemble as the as by definition as a drifted climo, because like you say, um, Kathy, the, the, the drifts show up very quickly, um, but of course then they, they build with time in terms of the magnitudes. If you're actually looking at the magnitude of the drifted climo for it to commute anomalies, the time scale I think really becomes important. As being mindful of the time, Steve, do you want to go over some of these ideas on the longer time scale? Sure. Um, yeah, so um, on the S2I front, um, we would like to do um, smile pacemaker experiments as part of uh, the working group activities um, in the coming year. Um, this is in conjunction with the Clivar um, um, Tropical Basin Interaction Panel. Um, and so we've got the small control already completed. And the idea would be to um, repeat hindcasts with um, SST restoring in the tropics of the different basins. Um, so that's an idea that's on the table. Um, I also really like the sort of attribution studies that we saw by um, John Fasulo and Nick Davis, and, and think there's a lot of potential to build off of um, the, the hind cast sets we already have to understand the uh, influences of particular forcings. Um, so th that's definitely um, something people can uh, propose for the next CSL allocation. And then, um, on the decadal time scale, you know, there, there's an option of further expanding the CSM2 DP set from um, 10 member to 20 member. We might want to first take a look at the skill we're getting with 10 members and see if it's potentially worth expanding on that experiment. And then uh, Liz Maroon put in an idea. I don't know if she wants to elaborate. She might not still be here. I'm still here and I'm not sure I have a clear idea. It's kind of half baked, but you know, something I've been noticing in DPLE and smiles that the ocean's pretty underspread. And granted, I haven't looked um, much more outside the sub North Atlantic, but I think it'd be interesting to do some sort of um, testing initialization strategies to get more spread in the ocean. I think Dan just mentioned that pretty well. So maybe I should just go and talk with Dan and see what the two of us think. Um, I don't know if you have any more thoughts, Dan. Thumbs up. Cool. Okay. <laughs> that was just very half-baked thoughts. Yeah, so do you have any comments on these or if you like to add, Gokhan, you have a hand up. Yeah, I was, I missed, on, I was on and off, missed some of the machine learning related uh, presentations, but is there a way or is there a possibility that any kind of AI machine learning techniques can be used to sort of help with the signal to noise ratio with, I mean, one possibility could be one can run maybe 10 ensemble members and perhaps additional sort of information can be contributed from some sort of machine learning technique to produce maybe coolant of 20 ensemble members in terms of its signal to noise ratio. Is, is there any work on that or is it even possible? I think our machine learning folks have left, um, but Judith has a hand up. Yeah, so I'm part of M squared lines, <clears throat> which is using machine learning to reduce coupled model biases in a research context. And then obviously there's leap which is doing it um, as an NSF center on a larger scale. 
But um, I think both of these projects really tried to uh, address the, the issue of, of model error. And uh, it could be to learn the model error itself, or it could be to learn a complete permutation instead. And so um, I think there will be interesting, it will be interesting to see what comes out of those. I think it's too early for the next two years, but the hope is that we will actually address some of the issues leading to coupled by, uh, bias drift. And, and so some of these things could be rerun with um, model error permanentizations that, that got informed from machine learning. Uh, in terms of the signal to noise, I'm not aware of anything, but, but I, I think Maria left. It's certainly possible to increase artificially the ensemble size using an emulator that is trained on, let's say, 10 ensemble members and, and see what that brings. Um, I, I'm not aware of any work that's doing this, but I, I think it should be it's very feasible to do it. But if it's pursued, I mean, it might be a cheaper alternative to running simply additional ensemble members continuously, right? Yeah. Well, the other um, method for increasing your ensemble size is to do a lagged ensemble, right? So you use members from your previous initialization. Right. You kind of do more of a temporal average with a larger ensemble as a result. All right, well, we're coming to the end of the hour here. So and then please feel free to just email the co-chairs or put things in a Google Doc. I think we're gonna to start to work on that proposal, I don't know, sometime in July. Um, and then lastly, maybe I'll put up a question. Is there anything else that the community, any other thoughts that they have on the working group and what they need from the university perspective? Well, I'm not seeing any hands up, Steve or Kathy. Do you have any last minute uh, words? Nope. nope. Yeah, just to, yeah, just to thank everyone for participating. I thought it was a really engaging session myself. Yeah, I agree. All right, well, thank you everybody. If there's anybody who would like to have an informal chat, Elizabeth, let us know that we could just keep the room open for 15 minutes if people just wanted to chat with other uh, ESP people. So 